testing. Can everybody hear us? How <laughs> <laughs> is everybody? This is a long time coming. Uh, sincerely appreciate you guys coming to the premiere episode. We've been doing these on Patreon for a long time. And I kind of got wrapped up in watching uh, YouTube live streams. Uh, just to make sure everybody can hear us. Okay, good. Uh, but I kind of coerced Georgie into doing <laughs> this on YouTube because I thought it would be more fun to get like a, rob a robust set of new opinions, you know, and not, not uh, put ourselves in an echo chamber. And I, I really value the time I have with Georgie and talking about things, and he gives me a lot of perspective. And so I thought it was kind of a crime to uh, kind of lock him away behind a paywall. So I don't know, Georgie, are you excited about YouTube? <laughs> Of course, <laughs> as long as they don't block us, I think it's a much more uh, realistic audience. I mean, we're going to get some people that don't don't necessarily agree with us, right? Um, and I, I think it's valuable. As uh, we, William Blake says, opposition is true friendship. We just have to be careful not to get too many of the negations. For sure. I don't. Do you want to like talk about maybe like a, a brief summary of your health adventure? Because I'm sure for a lot of people, this might be the first time they're seeing me or you, and they. <clears throat> probably have no idea of our, our like backgrounds you know yeah my uh, my background actually academic background is in computer science and mathematics um, and I graduated around 2003 and right at the time basically the dot-com crash had happened so there weren't many opportunities for people with computer science degrees uh, everybody was running away from us as like the plague mm -hmm. so uh, my first job out of college was at a biochemical outfit called the National Biomedical Research Foundation it's Used to be run right out, uh, of, like from a base out of a basement in Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. So I started a position um, as a uh, you know junior bioinformatics specialist. So it was it was still computer science, but it was it was with biological application. It just so happened that it was just me and another person who were the IT people amongst a group of forty to fifty, sometimes even sixty of the premier biochemists in the world. The old PhDs, MDs, some of them double degrees, some of them triple degrees. Um, and of course, you know, I worked there from 2000 and the fall of 2002 when I was an intern and I graduated, started full time until 2005. Mm -hmm. So for about three years, I was surrounded by people who did nothing except talk about biochemistry and diseases and proteins and, uh, and enzymes and things like that. And, and basically, um, I got interested. And uh, I started basically asking them, okay, so what do I do? How do I learn more about what you do? Well, you know, uh, most of them actually, interesting enough, said you don't need to go to school. Like none of that stuff is like it's it's not a waste of time, but you're going to spend a lot of money and time on something that's at this point is all online, mm -hmm. like, right? Mm -hmm. So all you need to do is come with us, hang out with us, go to our conferences, go to our speeches, go to our presentations. We're going to explain, keep asking questions. Here's an intro book to biochemistry, read it. Here's an intermediate book to biochemistry, read that one. Here's an advanced one. So after about two or three books and continuously discussing with them, I uh, started picking up their lingo, as they say. And then after that, they said, well, after this, it's all your research and PubMed, essentially. I mean, PubMed is the database, not the best one, but like the one that we most commonly use of basically reports on experimental research. So you read studies, you make up your hypothesis, and... If you want, you apply for funding and you get them tested, right? Um, so I haven't been able to do the testing yet, but for ever since 2002, essentially, so that's 17 years now, I've been putting a few hours every day into essentially reading on biomedical, on biochemical and medical topics. Um, in addition to that, I was a, an athlete in college, so I was very avid in the sports world. And when I graduated, I thought, well, I want to stay in shape. So rowing, I was a rower in college, and um, it's an endur endurance sport. So I enjoyed it while I was in college, and I stuck with it after graduation, and I slowly switched over to running, long-distance running. So um, around 2008, I was, I guess, through my reading of this biochemical lit literature, I started noticing more and more studies come up and start to advocate a low-carb diet as a way to like keep your excess weight away, right? Um, as a way to retard aging, as a way to improve insulin sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the more extreme ones were calling for full-blown ketosis. They said you need to be in ketosis. It has great benefits for preventing seizures. We think these benefits apply to basically systemic health. It's not only to the brain, right? 
So I was convinced. Uh, so I decided let's let's try it. And around 2008, when I first started, I think it was it was mo- most people hadn't even heard of it. I think the term paleo wasn't even coined at that time. It was just a low carb diet. Yeah, the first time I ever heard about ketosis was like 2007 ish. Right. Yeah. And, and ketosis is more like a medical term, right? But the paleo diet is a term. I think it was it happened probably started to hit the blogosphere around 2010 and later. So, anyways, I started doing low carb diet in 2008. Initially, things were great. I felt all this energy. Um, I did have a, like a carb withdrawal thing, which all the studies and including my doctor said, "Oh, don't worry, it's gonna pass. You just need to push through it." Right. So after about a month, it did disappear. So I had this almost manic-like energy, and later it did turn out to be exactly mania, right? So I said, oh, this is amazing. You know, I can run six miles uh, four or five times a week. Um, I don't feel a thing. I feel great. And not only that, but after I come back from from work, from workout, I can sit down and actually do work. My company, my employer at the time loved it. He said, this guy is amazing. He never takes a day off. He doesn't like vacation. All he does is run and work. I mean, you're like the dream employee. And then, unfortunately, around 2009, I started getting these, um, like, it all started with chronic insomnia. Uh, basically, after about a year, full-blown year on the on a very low-carb diet, I may have even hit ketosis at some point, I started uh, having trouble sleeping at night. And I went to the doctor a few times. He said, well, maybe you're working out too much. You know, you need to cut down on it, right? So I did. So, you know, maybe from running five times a week, I would do three times a week, even twice a week. Mm-hmm. It did not improve. And I talked to the doctor. He said, well, maybe, you're, uh, maybe your work is stressing you out. So I did try to reduce a little bit stress at work as well. It did help, but still I wasn't feel Something was off, right? Um, so so ben, then we basically, I kept not feeling right. And then, um, you know, around uh, late 2009, oh, uh, late 2009, there's some visitors in the office here. <laughs> um, I started getting these weird tingling sensations uh, in my extremities, I started getting low back pain. I started getting muscle weakness, which freaked me out. Yeah. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, um, there, there could be many things, but let's let's just do some, some, some tests, some serious tests to see what's going on. So I went for a full-blown MRI of the head and the spine. The doctor actually suspected multiple sclerosis. That was, that was the suggestion. And the neurologist thought the same thing. She said, all my symptoms are consistent with multiple sclerosis. But because the MRI didn't show anything, no lesions, you can't be diagnosed with MS unless you have basically um, imaging, imaging evidence. And so they said, okay, well, at this point, we're going to call it a um, um, you know, nonspecific symptomatology suggestive of a future possible acute attack of multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. But, but it was never – this is not a diagnosis. This is just something they write in the notes. And I asked, I asked to see the notes. So it kept getting worse and worse. Um, and eventually I went to my doctor and said, look, this is really not working. And he just started saying, oh, it's all in your head. Let's put you on antidepressants. I said, no, I'm not depressed. Dude, I'm, I'm anxious, right? Depressed people are usually very, they don't want to do anything. In fact, I want to do too much, like, but to the point where I can't even stop myself from doing too much. And, you know, of course, in hindsight, and after I did my checks, it all turned out to be really high cortisol and prolactin. Mm-hmm. But he never actually, my doctor never suggested this. Neither the primary care physician nor the neurologist. They basically said, no, it's all in your head. We, we want to put you on antidepressants. I said, no. And then it just went like this. And then one day, I think I, I by almost by accident, I thought I was reaching for a Diet Coke. But I actually grabbed a drink that had like a significant amount of sugar in it. And I just, you know, I just, you know, drank the whole thing. And then within, within like literally within a minute, this wave of calmness just just rushed over me. Was that your and I said, sugar addiction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got my hit, you know, and I, I returned back to normality. So I, I just said, what's going on? I've been drinking these Diet Cokes for all, these, for all this time. Like, this can't be, right? And I, to my horror, they had one uh, remaining Coke, which was regular, right? And and, and it was from my pre uh low low carb diet days and basically in horror i noticed that i had drank it all Mm -hmm. so so basically i went online i said well i need to do more research on that so i kept typing like basically uh high sugar low stress and then ray pete's website popped up and then after that i guess all this history but what i did is basically despite against the advice of my doctor 
I used that company, Direct Labs, uh-huh. and I did some tests because it, after I gulped Ray Pete's website in one night, in one sitting, I was manic. <laughs> so I read everything he had to publish. So I said, after knowing already a little bit about biochemistry and biology, I said, okay, so if this guy's right and it, it everything he mentions is so it matches my symptoms perfectly. This means my cortisol should be should be high, my estrogen should be high, my prolactin should be high, my serotonin. So at the time, Direct Labs didn't do serotonin testing. They only did cortisol and they only did prolactin. Well, guess what? Both came sky high, basically. Prolactin was, well, I shouldn't say sky high, but prolactin was 50. Mm-hmm. Wow. And yeah, and, and cortisol, I, I did both morning and, and a.m. and p.m. cortisol, and I did two draws, two blood draws at the same day because you want not only you want to see the levels that because the ranges are different, the normal range for a.m. and p.m. cortisol are different, but you also you want to see the pattern. In other words, cortisol in the morning should be higher and the afternoon should be lower. No, I had basically elevated cortisol, a flat line that was just above, well, it was about 20% above the normal range for the morning one, which is higher than the, than the p.m., and it was flat. It never went down. Mm-hmm. So I took the test to the to the PCP, to the primary care uh, physician. He said, "Dude, you, you under you under tremendous stress. Let's do another MRI just to rule out prolactinoma." Um, and I said, "We got into a little bit of an argument." I said, "Listen, this. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I read I read this website and I checked the studies. Even even all endocrinologists say, look, prolactin under a hundred is one in a million chance this is a prolactinoma. Yeah. Usually, it's chronic stress." Liver problems, kidney problems, things, things like that. He said, no, that's all BS. It's, that's not true. So I, I agreed to the MRI. Of course, no prolactinoma. He got so angry. He said, no, this is impossible. Prolactin of 50, it's probably like a microprolactinoma. We need to do a biopsy. I said, are you out of your mind? Why would I agree to a biopsy to, let's say you're right. What's the treatment? Well, bromocryptine. So why don't you give me the bromocryptine if it's a prolactinoma and it's supposed to disappear on bromocryptine? Well, I can't prescribe it because you need to be that. I'm like, listen, I'm not getting a needle stuck in my brain, okay? Yeah. If you want, you can go do that. <laughs> so anyways, I refused. And basically, I said, okay, back to normality. So I immediately increased my sugar intake. Um, and I retested my cortisol a week later. Prolactin went down to 19. So it was barely within range, but it's a huge drop within a week. Oh, yeah. So I took these tests back to the doctor. Cortisol was in range. Prolactin was in range. He said, then he admitted, okay, it cannot be prolactinoma because if it's prolactinoma, it always pumps out prolactin. It will never go back to normal unless you get a drug. So he shut up. Um, so since then, basically, I've been following the Ray's research and doing my own, reading <laughs> voraciously um, to the point of, I would say, between 2009, 2012, until my health really stabilized, I've probably put in at least six to eight hours a day of reading on top of my, my day job. I know a f- few people that are, I mean, I don't know how much you read, but you're posting so often. And I know for myself, I have like so many papers that I don't, I haven't, I haven't gotten to yet. And so uh, it can be a chore sometimes just to go through and, and find the useful information. But I think you're a, a prolific poster. So that's what initially attracted me to you because it felt like you were going above and beyond. You posted obviously on the Ray Peep forum, but you were you're kind of going above and beyond and breaking down the articles and things like that. And and it, after a while, it was like undeniable that how useful your posts were. And then I and when I lived in San Francisco, I got you on the phone. Uh, do you remember that? <laughs> and I, yeah, 2015. Uh, uh, so I started posting on the Ray Peep forum about around 2012, right? So for about three years, I kept posting pretty much everything I read and I thought it would be useful. I posted out there and, you know, I, I extracted things that people think would be useful that emphasize the gist of the research. And basically, I think you called me, it was like summer of 2015 and said, hey, dude, like, how about getting on my pod- podcast? Do you have any interest? Well, my, like, like, sure. my ulterior motives for calling you was like, I, this guy can obviously post and write really well, but like, can he talk? And when I got you on the phone, within like 20 seconds, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the guy. <laughs> like, this is going to work out perfectly. And so. Um, yeah, my suspicious Bulgarian broken English <laughs> Bulgarian accent. Oh, no, I mean, like you're you are just like easy to talk to. You're like filled with knowledge and you can talk. And that's kind of what I need. I need somebody to bounce uh, ideas off of that has like right. a better understanding of things than I do. And I, that's why I think. That's why I, that's why I think this kind of partnership, if you want to call it that, 
has kind of lasted uh, the amount of time it has. But but for anybody that doesn't know, we did, I don't know how many, but many different podcasts. And I, I kind of got super burnt out. And so we're kind of like reigniting this. And we did it on Patreon and now we're moving it to YouTube, obviously. But I'm super excited because uh, the whole negative part about the podcasting was editing, which would take so long. And yeah. And just the the proliferation of live streams on YouTube and how good they've gotten and me watching them and being excited to watch them has really changed my perception of doing live streams on YouTube. So, um, well, I guess we, we both learned firsthand just how damaging stress can be, right? Yeah, to sorry, you it was I, the podcast, right? All, you burned out. And that, that actually the burnout syndrome right now is a huge problem, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. So many people are experiencing. Actually, it has been shown that – it is due to high cortisol. Um, it just it just initially you makes you manic, but eventually puts you into almost like a depressive state where where you're, you you produce so little energy that you you lose interest in almost everything. You just want to sit there and stare at a wall for like eight hours and then sleep and repeat. <laughs> well, well, thank you for bringing it back. Uh, I was. Do you want to try to encapsulate maybe the energy structure idea to the best of your like an elevator pitch? Because again, I think a lot of people on YouTube are uh maybe seeing things of of like vegan or carnivore and you know and that is like the right. dominant argument online and so we're coming from a different perspective and so maybe we should just like lay it's it, on the screen people can see ray's quote like if we see problems in the terms of general disorder of energy metabolism we can begin to solve them and yeah. i put that there specifically because that is like the context of everything we're talking about you know that's what we're thinking about the energy metabolism the production of carbon dioxide what are the hormones doing how is the environment influencing the hormones and then on a deeper level the redox balance and so uh there's a method to the madness but do you do you want to try to do an elevator pitch or something sure i guess i'll say what the mainstream idea of medicine currently is is basically they treat us like a car right and then this car is a result of genes. Everybody has a unique genome, and these, this, this, this collection of genes codes for specific proteins. And then the RNA produces these proteins, and what you are is essentially just the, just the result, the, material, the materialization of all the information that's stored in your genes. So you are, in, in other words, you, the car, are a product of your genes. And then, yes, they do agree that in order for you to run as a car, as an individual, you need energy. But in terms of structure and energy, which is provide, which enables you to perform certain functions, these things are separate. So to this day, you go to a doctor, and if they think you have a problem, the first thing that they'll try to do is is discover if you have a structural problem, right? And if you have a structural problem, they'll try to correct it with surgery, you know, drugs, radiation, if it's cancer, things like that. But if it's a functional problem, they're mostly powerless and they even they, they even have a term for it it's called a functional disorder irritable bowel syndrome is considered a functional disorder they admit exi it exists but they don't know what's causing it because in their mind the energy in other words the function and the structure are separate things and it's usually the structure that influences the energy right they will admit that because if you have a, a, a gene mutation for something that let's say a mitochondrial disorder then they'll admit that the structure affects the energy and you can produce properly energy in your mitochondria but they vehemently deny that the that the opposite happens as well in other words if you have a functional disorder if you have a problem with your your the, your metabolic pathways and production of energy m most doctors that i've met will vehemently deny that this would have an effect on structure so the metabolic theory the energetic theory says that um, energy and structure are basically the same thing uh, they they're interdependent. They cannot be separated. They always interact, and and a, and a disturbance in one uh, almost immediately leads to a disturbance in the other. Uh, it's almost like the yin yang of the Chinese philosophy. And 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 basically, if you even if you don't, and the reason I, uh, you know this this matches well with stress is that uh, stress would be a, a, what the doctors would call a functional disorder. You're under constant stress. You don't produce in properly energy because when your cortisol is high and all the other stress hormones are high. This essentially interferes with the production of energy in the mitochondria. It, uh, it, it increases glycolysis, but as we know, if, if glycolysis, if the glycolytic intermediates build up, eventually you start overproducing lactic acid. But you don't produce, you don't go through the, through the, uh, the three stages of, of the regular metabolism, so you don't produce enough, enough ATP. 
So over time, the doctors will say, well, it's not a pleasant state to be in, but basically this is not having an any, any long-term impact on your structure. And metabolic theory says, no, that's not true. In fact, um, all of these disorders that we're seeing around us, so far not a single gene mutation has been found to be responsible for them. There, there is To this day, there is no gene that has been found for diabetes. There is no gene that has been found for cancer, with a possible exception of the BRCA family, but even those are, are not entirely black and white. Uh, there's no gene for Alzheimer's. There's no gene for schizophrenia. There's no gene for any of the chronic debilitating diseases, sometimes lethal, lethal diseases that are plaguing society. Well, in the metabolic theory, the basically the view is that, well, all of these are caused by chronic interference with the proper production of energy, with the proper movement of electrons from food to the ultimate electron acceptor, which is oxygen. Anything that interferes with the movement of those electrons along this pathway will lead first to functional pathology, and over time, if it continues chronically, it will, read, it will lead to structural derangements which uh, the probably the most uh, uh, um, the, the most uh, uh, I should say the simplest example will be I guess the liver disease because it is very well accepted that if you have fatty liver disease and you don't treat it eventually it progresses into non-alcoholic steatohepatitis after that you progress into cirrhosis and eventually to liver cancer so even medicine admits that this one condition that starts as a very functional condition fatty liver disease which is known to be caused by, you know, uh, elevated lipolysis, not enough ATP production, uh, elevated serotonin, it can actually give you eventually cancer without any change of the genome, without any mutations. Well, metabolic theory says the same is true of every other chronic disease. And anything that interferes with, with your proper synthesis, with a, your proper production of energy, I guess uh, most people think of it as ATP, right? Anything that interferes with the synthesis of ATP and carbon dioxide, which is not a waste byproduct, eventually will lead to structural derangements. And depending, I guess, on which organ is the weakest, which system, which tissue is the weakest, that's the one. That's where it will manifest. But don't forget, it is always a systemic disorder. In the absence of very serious evidence to the contrary, all disorders should be treated as systemic because the energetic d disturbance is produced in the entire body. It's not just a specific set of cells. Cells communicate both chemically and now we know electromagnetically, as I've posted in a number of studies. So uh, let's say if you have a problem in your knee, eventually uh, this becomes known to the entire organism and then resources start getting shifted towards that problem. But this means, given that the resources are limited, that other organs will get deprived of them. So over time you get this chronic adaptive reaction to whatever stressor there is and by stress i just don't mean uh, uh, it doesn't just uh, refer to a mean mom that yells at you it means anything that interferes with the proper production of energy so that's really what the energetic theory is all about anything that interferes with this process with the function will cause a problem structural problem eventually and of course once you have the structural problem that amplifies the functional problem as well uh, can you guys hear me now i think my mic volume was too low, but hopefully you guys can. But I, Ray really perfectly uh, uh, termed stress in a few interviews he did uh, before, but he said that it was a mismatch between the environment and the organism's right. resources. And I was like, oh man, exactly. that's beautiful, you know? But yeah. I think you're right that we should define those terms because obviously we're going to say them so much. And um, in, in, yeah, like in stress, metabolic stress or stress hormones are actually counter regulatory hormones. So they have different names and things, but, um, did you, I mean, to bring it down a bit, like you're, you're listing off all these mechanisms for mitochondria and energy production and things like that. Do you think the temperature and pulse are practical ways to kind of take that information and utilize it in a day to day basis? Like, uh, like a, a practical use for that type of information that you're talking about? Yes, and I think you should use both of them because sometimes, let's say if you're under stress and your adrenaline is high, your pulse will be high, right? But if you check your the, the, the temperature of your extremities, it will actually be low. So it's, it should always be done in tandem, like pulse and temperature. And ideally, um, going back to the work of Broder Barnes and many other people who have noticed this problem with, ener with energetic dysfunction, uh, waking uh, armpit temperature the basically the pulse rate should if it's below 85 it signals an issue with thyroid hormone production or progesterone production or testosterone for males those are the hormones that uh, that have positive inotropic and, and chronotropic effects on the heart 
Um, and I think the most uh, the most reliable test is actually the the Achilles tendon relaxation reflex. And it was a very old test for hypothyroidism, but now they're finding out that actually it can predict. Recently, there was a study that came out. It, it can predict uh, the risk of developing dementia over the next ten years. And now they're even starting to suspect that it can predict the risk of all-cause mortality, at least in aging males. So little by little, we're starting to see that these tests that basically show you a systemic disturbance in energy production are have really high predictive value for a lot of terrible chronic diseases, and including just overall mortality. Uh, I don't know of any other tests that, that medicine has come up with over the last 50 years that has this predictive ability. I think only one came close. I think it was like albumin. Basically, if you have chronically low albumin, that is a pretty pretty decent indication that things are not going well systemically. Uh, but the uh, pulse temperature Achilles tendon reflex is a great example. It's a great way to gauge whether you have a problem with energy production or not. So, so I just pulled, you probably, you can't see it, but I just pulled up Dan's ankle sign of hypothyroidism, which is like, like su su such a good video. And Dan did just an amazing job. So if anybody needs to put some of these ideas into practice, you can thump your ankle or have a partner thump your ankle. You can take your underarm temperature upon waking and then again in the uh, afternoon after lunch. You can take your, and like Georgie said, you could d do it in tandem with the pulse rate. And then that could give you an estimate of your metabolic rate. And, and, and another great test, oh sorry, uh, would be like the urine test, which Ray mentioned, which I love a lot as well. So basically, um, you, uh, I, I think you, you use about um, one liter of water for every a thousand calories burned, right? So you you monitor how much you drink throughout the day, and then you monitor how much you pee out. And the difference between what you ingest and what you urinate is your resting metabolic rate, right? So if you drank three liters and you peed out two, you only burn a thousand calories that day. So that is a you know it's a great example of low metabolism. So most diets are geared for a 2,000 calorie metabolic type a day, right? But it, since everybody is different, uh, you don't want to be. I mean, depending on your weight, usually if it, this is like a male that's let's say 35 and weighs 75 kilos, uh, a resting uh, like a daily metabolic, a daily calorie consumption or daily caloric expenditure of a thousand calories is abysmally low. Unf but I have seen it. It, and even lower, I've seen even lower in competitive athletes, believe it or not. And 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 many people think of competitive athletes as these really healthy people. And that may be partially true when they're really young, like let's say in their you know late teens and early 20s. But these people are known to dramatically deteriorate after they stop their competitive career. And many of them young die pretty young. Um, and then they found out that uh, competitive athletes, there's a, there's a term for female athletes called the female the female athlete triad. So the most successful female athletes suffer from amenorrhea, um, basically infertility, um, and I think depression is like the third one. So they have a term that basically if you're this really successful female athlete, you're not very healthy because you can't have babies. You can't, you, you're depressed, you're um, I mean, the, and then I think cardiovascular disease is another thing they found is associated with with really successful competitive athletes, both both males and females. Um, um, exercise induced hypogonadism is an actual term at this point for male athletes, and is exceedingly common. It's I think it, uh, some estimates say that between fifty to seventy five percent of the co most competitive athletes have that. But how they get around to it? Well, many of them use steroids, right? So, so it masks it for a while, but eventually after the competitive career ends, there is really no way to mask it. These people rapidly gain weight, and then they look like nothing <laughs> what they used to look when they, were, when they were competitive athletes. It's considered normal, but actually it shows you just how, they, how low their metabolism is because they were actually burning calories through stress. They were overexerting themselves, and through adrenaline, basically adrenaline, this exercise that everybody does is, is a forceful way to raise your metabolism, but it's not a good way because you can. It's known that chronically forcing yourself ultimately leads to a very severe heart, uh, heart problems and cardiovascular problems and mental problems as well. So, but if you measure these people resting metabolic rate, their daily caloric expenditure when they're not training, I've seen competitive athletes at the Olympic level that that basically burn 800 calories a day, and those are grown males that weigh 80 kilograms. Uh, I guess in pounds will be 170, 180 pounds, 
and these people have the metabolism of 10 year old ch children so it's 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 really not a good situation but it's a very reliable way to gauge your metabolism well i'm glad you mentioned that because the healthy athletes is a constant thing that's brought up but speaking of child do you think a, a, another way of looking at it is what we're talking about is trying to mimic the metabolism of a healthy child and uh, getting adultified as you get older is kind of the slowdown of the metabolic rate and kind of accumulating imperfect repairs. And, and again, all many different things in the environment, not just nutrition, but like the EMF, the light, uh, the culture, you know, the super toxic culture that we're, it's shoved down in our faces, everybody, you know, those are all contributing to this impaired stress response, suppressed thyroid function, increase in cortisol, serotonin, prolactin, all the other things we'll talk about. Yeah, all of these are adaptive mechanisms. So uh, I think anecdotally, most people know that a, a child, when a child cuts itself or breaks a bone or, ha or has some other kind of trauma, basically the child is able to recover almost flawlessly to the point where, uh, I mean, I guess the most visible example is scars. Like a child under, I think under seven would very rarely even have scars from surgery remaining after a few years. They would all they would all disappear. Well, the the Cynthia Illingworth is the one with the most common childhood injury, where they got their the whatever this is called the index of their finger cut off. And if she just didn't send them into surgery, they would if they were under seven or ten, I forget the exact age, they would completely regenerate their fingers with like out any issues. Yeah, and she found out that when she wraps a piece of plastic like on top of the finger that's cut off and then cut basically tightens it up so that it builds up carbon dioxide in it, then the recovery will be perfect. Mm -hmm. There will be absolutely no way to tell that this child had a severe trauma where basically a piece of the bone was, was, was cut off. Mm -hmm. so, so we know instinctively and anecdotal, we've seen it around us, children are capable of recovering very quickly, even from emotional stress. They may cry a little bit, right, but they'll take a quick nap. This is actually a very, a very a good indicator because it's an indicator that the child is has exhausted its energetic resources, so it needs to sleep and recover. That's, but and that works while we're young. But as we are growing older and we're continually exposed to all of these assaults, which we call stress, right? There are many different stressors. As as our production of energy declines, the body cannot repair as as well as it used to when we were children, right? So one of the first things that declines, and many people will probably have experienced this firsthand, as I did, is quality of sleep. You no longer have recovering restorative sleep. You have these like um, one to two to three hour like sessions of sleep where it's very shallow. Sometimes you may even have nightmares, right? You wake up very often, especially if you get up and pee at night. That is a great indication that something metabolically is not working well. And over time, because our energy production keeps declining, the repair mechanisms obviously cannot work as well. We go back to the analogy that I gave in the beginning. You're not just a car that needs fuel simply to run. The energy is necessary for actually recovering, repairing the structure. And if you're not producing the energy properly, it, the, the repair will be imperfect. And in extreme circumstances, the body will either shut off an organ or a tissue completely to the point, an example will be, I guess, fibrotic liver. Basically, the body gives up on that organ. And in the very, very, very extreme case, you become, you, you get the process of cancerization. And many people think of cancer as this terrible disease that's just an attempt to kill you. No, it's actually the extremely ineffective method of the body repairing itself. It's trying to build a new organ, but be in, a, in an environment, this re these repair mechanisms exist. We are nothing but a growing machines, but it's the production of energy that restrains that growth and channels it into various organs intelligently. When you don't have the energy, we revert back to the growing machines, and that's what you get, an imperfect organ which never stops growing because to restrain growth, ironically, you need energy. Without that, only with a primitive production of energy, all that you can support is growth, un undifferentiated growth, which is cancer. And that's towards the higher NADH to NAD ratio in, on the cell level. And those are exactly. mediated by hormones like specifically estrogen under the umbrella of thyroid, progesterone, pregnenolone, DHEA. And, and so it's, uh, it, it, it becomes much more of a serious issue when those protective hormones and, and are, aren't around because like you just said, you promote unrestrained growth right. and you can't um, differentiate and specialize 
the functions of the cells. Is that right? Yeah. And the reason these protective hormones aren't around is because their synthesis also requires energy. The side chain cleavage enzyme, which is in the mitochondria, which is the first step of converting cholesterol into all the downstream hormones, is dependent on ATP. So if you don't have ATP, you, you basically you get this buildup of cholesterol. So one of the great indirect surrogate biomarkers of low metabolism, which you probably immediately realize that now everybody's hypothyroid, everybody's hypometabolic because a, almost every single person with age gets a diagnosis of elevated cholesterol. Well, it's not a problem. It's actually a sign, a biomarker that you can you are not converting the cholesterol into the into the downstream hormones. So in extreme situations of stress and which which mimic very well the extreme aging, all you get basically all the body can produce are the emergency hormones which do nothing except keep keep you alive. That's cortisol, estrogen, prolactin, serotonin. But you're not really a human anymore. It's just a collection of cells that is deranged. There is no field guiding them to do anything intelligent. And and I think many people have realized that when they talk to very old people, you just get a piece of meat which is alive biologically but cannot really be interacted with in any meaningful way. And I don't mean this in a in a demeaning way, in a bad way. That's how we all would be if we are in an extremely energetically depleted state. The same thing happens with patients when they're undergoing surgery and waking up in a delirium. It's called a post-anesthetic delirium. The same thing is happening when people are so exhausted and tired that they basically go berserk and become homicidal or suicidal. That's what happens. Ultimately, aggression, um, violence, all kinds of pathological behavior ultimately stem from insufficient or imperfect production of energy and the replacement of that of the normal state with the pathological state, which is we're going to cut off everything that makes you human. We're going to shut it down, and the only thing that remains is the proverbial lizard brain. That's all you are. Uh, I do want to get onto your post, but I, I feel like compelled to put one more piece of the puzzle and the, the PUFA puzzle piece and maybe we could briefly talk about why that is so detrimental to the uh, steroid hormone production also the energy production and how it's if you grew up in the west it's likely already accumulated to such a degree <laughs> that it is causing massive problems you know nobody's getting out of this unscathed like everybody's being affected by this unless you know, your parents are extremely enlightened and, and you you never ate PUFA as a child. But do you want to fit that into the conversation in any way you, you see fit? Sure. So I'll start by uh, basically discussing the topic of inflammation because I think many people will be familiar with that. I just saw a blog on Harvard Medical School website today mm -hmm. and it basically said, we've got it, we've gotten it all wrong. Inflammation is the true cause of of all chronic disease and even infectious disease. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they do a very good job of, of explaining in very simple language that, you know, there's there hasn't been a single disease that, it, that they've picked up and looked, it, it, tried to analyze it, and that it did not find that inflammation was a major cause, if not the main cause of that disease. Of course, they give the examples of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, but they, then they also talk about viral and bacterial infections. Apparently, inflammation plays a role there as well. It, it's just if you're under chronic low-grade inflammatory stress, you, you're much more susceptible to bacteria, both bacterial and viral infections. So again, so uh, the doctors at this point, mainstream medicine as I like to call them, they're saying, wow, scratching their heads. Well, I guess inflammation is indeed a major cause. There is no such thing as healthy inflammation. That's what that's that's the one of the most poisonous ideas being pro, uh, promoted over the last 100 years that you we need inflammation because it's part of the repair mechanism. Yes, but remember, repair mechanisms can get out of hand unless they're accompanied by sufficient energy production which can restrain them. Mm -hmm. If you don't restrain them, then they're no longer uh, they're not they're adaptive but in a bad way. They become maladaptive. Well, guess what? M I guess the, about 80% of the inflammatory reaction in the body is controlled by the precursor arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid is, is derived from the dietary omega-6 uh, uh, basically fatty acids known as PUFA. PUFA also includes omega-3, right? They're considered less inflammatory. In fact, many studies are promoting this anti-inflammatory. And that is in a very perverse way true, but only because they displace the omega-6 and they they feed into these enzymes that metabolize arachidonic acid. So there is, they're, they're, um, they're, they're being metabolized into 
less inflammatory mediators. But the omega-6, and especially the arachidonic acid, they're basically, it's the precursor to the prostaglandins and leukotrienes, and I think also the thromboxanes. And these three collectively are responsible for the about 80% of the inflammatory response. That, that's, just, that's just this one pathway. In addition to that, the PUFAs, due to their highly unsaturated nature, they actually change the affinity of the cell for water. And, and what happens is that the, normally the cell is a highly lipophilic entity, and it, it, it excludes most of the bulk water that it encounters in the bloodstream. But when you're when the bloodstream is filled with these unsaturated acids, and the more unsaturated the, of unsaturated fats, and the more unsaturated they are, the more the less lipophilic they are, the more hydrophilic they become. And when they fill up in the cell, they basically make a change. They increase the cell's affinity for water. And if a, a cell starts to absorb water, that is one of the primordial signals for cell division and growth. And there are many other. They're actually endogenous hormones. They do the exact same thing. The most common one, the most popular one is estrogen. Another one is prolactin, serotonin. All of these have one thing in common. They shut off the energetic production and they tell the cell, look, times are bad. We're under stress. You don't have time to differentiate into a brain cell, become a dividing, growing, and we call it a cancer cell. But I guess the, the biggest difference between what mainstream medicine calls cancer in our view is that there is no such thing as a cancer cell. There is a cell, and th th there's been a debate which also on Reddit, which we, you may want to bring up later. There was a study published, I think it was in the JAMA, one of the famous medical journals, which said, for 100 years we've been telling people that genetic mutations cause cancer, mm -hmm. but we've been wrong. It's actually the other way around. Mm -hmm. It's the cellular metabolic derangement mm -hmm. that eventually results in mutations. So what happens is that PUFA is a key signal to, first of all, to damage many tissues through the process of inflammation, which ultimately leads to fibrosis, scarring, and in general dysfunction in any organ or tissue that we know. Most, the most probably popular example would be, uh, you know, uh, heart dysfunction, uh, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, things like that. They're known very to be affected by inflammation very intimately, right? But also, PUFA itself, even without the metabolism into the pro-inflammatory mediators, it just has a very basic pro-division, pro-growth signal. Um, that is not mim this mimicked by these endogenous hormones. And now, if you if you walk up to any endocrinologist and say, "Is estrogen is estrogen dangerous?" Most endocrinologists at this point will say, "Probably yes, when it's in excess." Well, guess what? Even if your estrogen is normal by eating these things from your diet, which we've been we've been told for a hundred years they're great for us. The more unsaturated, the better. Load up yourself on omega-3. Load up yourself on omega-6. Mazola, your husband, as there was a commercial in the 50s for Mazola oil. was for gear, It was basically targeting housewives. said, Mazola, your husband, Mazola, your ch children. <laughs> this is the healthy way to go. Well, guess what? You're ingesting a highly estrogenic, pro-growth, anti-differentiating substance that mimics almost every effect that estrogen itself has. And by extension, these are not things that we should be really looking forward towards eating. Back in the early 20th century, it was known that the overconsumption, and by, by overconsumption, they actually meant levels even less than what we're consuming nowadays in our diet. But anyways, what they called overconsumption of unsaturated fat caused something called yellow fat disease. And it was known to be caused by deficiency of vitamin E and an excess of unsaturated fat. It was happening most commonly on uh, ship trailers, uh, on trawlers. Basically, these people that would work on ships and and they they, they would uh, you know fish all year, and because they were subsisting on a diet mostly uh, made up of of, uh, of cold water fish, which is highly abundant in omega three and some of the omega six, um, they these people were developing this yellow fat disease, and it was it was mimicking every symptom of Alzheimer's or of Parkinson, and it was noticed to be caused by a deficiency of vitamin E because it's known that vitamin E and unsaturated fats oppose each other, and it was easily curable, at least before it gets to the lethal point, by simply giving people a little bit of extra vitamin E. So all of these things we're getting from our diet, and they're everywhere because they're so cheap to produce, almost every commercial food you eat, it doesn't matter if it's McDonald's, doesn't matter if it's Burger King, even Whole Foods, like the, the, the food buffet is mostly produced with canola oil. And canola oil is very high in these inflammatory, estrogenic, growth-promoting omega-6 um, uh, fatty acids. 
Uh, two additional ways to I, I feel like to frame the the EPA and DHA uh, how they're not useful is one they're both uh, precursors for lipid peroxidation. Like you can't you can't Malone generate, the, generate yeah. the yeah the lipid peroxides without the highly unsaturated fatty acids. And then uh, the other one is isn't DHA like specifically um, a substrate for acrolein? And again, yes. if if, yes. If, it's, if a person types in acrolein or lipid peroxidation, you're it's not a um, you're not going to get two sides of an argument. It's like no no person thinks. I mean, no, uh, it's not framed in research like these are good things or useful. They're they're a hundred percent cell like aging and inflammatory. And so the fact that like it's not often talked about that the EPA EP, um, EPA and DHA are uh, promote these processes is, is pretty odd. Yeah, and by the way, medicine has done a little bit of a good job on the omega-3 side. Actually, they're not recommending that you should be loading up on fish all the time pre precisely for that reason. They know very well that highly unsaturated fats increase the lipid peroxidation. That's not a good thing. So even your like your household doctor, your your family medicine professional will tell you once or twice eating fish a week is enough. Like don't do more because like we, we they know that that it's not good. So the pescatarians, they probably are. are I mean, it's it's not something that even modern medicine would recommend. Now it would be great if medicine also turned around and said, well, guess what? The omega six is not that much better either. And I think the reason the omega-3 fads started, aside from the fact that the fish industry did a very uh, he heavy lobbying, they even did ghostwriting because they wanted to get rid of omega-3 oils, which are a waste product of the fishing industry. So it's a great way to make money on something that typically you throw out. They used to give it to, uh, they used to sell it to the agriculture industry as basically feeding, um, feeding material for the animals. Mm -hmm. But they, then the farmers wisened up and they noticed that if you raise pigs, on on the, on the, on this like diet that's made up of ground up fish and it's like it's got too much omega three the pigs start dying too early like you 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 can't really raise it to the point of where the pig is healthy enough to be slaughtered and sold they start dying you know much much younger and, and some of the some of uh, I guess uh, another reason for the fat was that the medical the medical industry and it is an industry they noticed that if you feed animals a slightly higher proportion of omega three towards omega six it delays the development of cardiovascular disease and other diseases associated with the aging. It doesn't, but it not only doesn't prevent them, it actually when they develop, are actually worse. So I guess they decided, okay, well, we can buy you maybe 10 years more of a more or less like uh, healthy, li healthy living. Uh, eventually you'll succumb, <laughs> you'll come down much harder and probably something much worse. And a great example is prostate cancer. Omega-3 is known now to cause the lethal variety of prostate cancer in a cancer type that's typically not lethal for most men. Um, so I guess they said, well, we'll give you 10 more years, but, you know, eventually it will be, it'll be worse. Um, unfortunately, I'm not seeing the same change of heart, change of minds towards omega-6. They still are getting promoted despite the multiple, um, the multiple reversal studies that came out of JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine. Even FDA, they said there, is, there has been no evidence. They reviewed... Uh, all the original evidence for for vilifying saturated fat and said, guess what, we were wrong. But I didn't see that be, being highly publicized. I saw it on maybe on CNN, and the link disappeared within a day. Uh, by the way, FDA already reversed its stance on cholesterol. It said dietary cholesterol has no role in the development of cardiovascular disease. So you can you can eat all the eggs you want. It just doesn't. It, FDA is not going to warn you anymore, at least about cholesterol. And they, I think they almost did the same public uh, health announcement on saturated fat, but the, there was heavy lobbying from the corn industry, which gets heavy subsidies from the government. It's one of the most powerful lobbies in, in, uh, in the agricultural industry. They said, don't you dare go against omega-6. This is in corn oil. We want, our, we want to keep mazzoling the population. <laughs> We're making billions of dollars from that. So the same study that the FDA used to reverse its stance on cholesterol – also concluded that saturated fat is safe as well, but the FDA unfortunately didn't go, didn't take that second conclusion. They only, they only went with a cholesterol one. So we haven't talked about endotoxin yet, and so I pulled up your article on your website, hateit.me, which everybody can go there or follow along on screen. 
Uh, but it says all gut bacteria is dangerous. Their endotoxin drives liver cancer. Antibiotics can cure. And so this is, I, I mentioned to you off air, but like this was interesting to me because I think one of our first podcasts, we talked about the idea that you couldn't necessarily separate like the gut biome into good and bad bacteria. And uh, I think you had mentioned that you you found evidence for, for uh, even the so-called good varieties to be pathological. And so you got a lot of shit for that. And so, yeah. so this, uh, go ahead and kind of uh, paint your, your, your picture of uh, the all gut bacteria is dangerous. So I should clarify this, but all, all gut bacteria capable of producing endotoxin is actually, in fact, a bad one. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, which, which includes um, uh, most of the, the bacteria sold as probiotic supplements in the stores. Mm-hmm. So you've been told that, oh, you have uh, maybe have overgrowth, like your microbiome is being opportunistically colonized by pathogenic bacteria. You can restore it by feeding this other bacteria. Well, guess what? As long as it produces endotoxin, you're probably not doing yourself much good. And two, f- two seminal studies came out in the last year. You you already have one on the screen. And there was another one, which I posted previously, which basically showed that this bacteria not only produces endotoxin, but it actually is, is capable of translocating somehow from the colon into various organs and tissues around the body. And the first study that I posted, it showed that this bacteria is actually directly causative of pancreatic cancer, which is, I think at this point, is the second most lethal cancer in the United States or in the Western world in general after melanoma. This So pancreatic cancer has an abysmal 3% five-year survival rate. So most people die within the first six months. And in the animal study, which, which tested this, showed that simply giving these animals tetracycline antibiotics prevented you know, almost all the animals prevented the development of the pancreatic cancer. And in the animals that had already developed it, I think in fully 60% actually cured it. Um, and by cure, I mean that the, the tumors, I mean, some tumors completely disappeared and others shrank to the point that the animals lived as long as the control group, which didn't have any tumors. So, you, you know, I guess officially you still be called that you have cancer, but it wasn't lethal. You, the, these animals lived like other normal animals. They, they look normal. They ate normal they reproduce normally. They, they they lived as if they did not have cancer. And now this second study comes out, and it shows that the same thing happens for liver cancer. Um, I don't think they showed translocation of the actual bacteria from colon to the liver in this study. They actually showed that the byproduct of the bacteria, which we all have, the endotoxin, is actually capable of triggering a chronic immune reaction, chronic inflammatory reaction through the receptor TLR4, which is the and uh, the receptor that basically detects the presence of endotoxin in the blood. And that alone is sufficient to actually cause the cancer. You don't need genetic mutations. You don't need uh, like carcinogens. I mean, those of course can, can cause the cancer as well. But so for example, you know, ionizing radiation, it, it, it directly causes DNA strand break. So it can, it can give you cancer over time by, by causing these mutations. But this one, there's no mutation. Uh, there's no radiation. There were no carcinogens given all it did was basically uh, it had two groups, one group of, of mice that had their colons completely clean with antibiotics, and in the other group, which had, <laughs> uh, they even had a group which, which which had their colons colonized with so-called good bacteria. Well, both groups that had the pathogenic and the good bacteria, quote-unquote, both of these groups developed liver cancer, and for both groups, giving antibiotics was actually highly, it was curative, for the majority of the cases, again, just like the rat study with the pancreatic cancer, most of these animals had either their tumors completely disappear or shrink to the point where they weren't causing any organ dysfunction and then the animals lived as long as the control group. And just to point out, there are some harmful antibiotics. It's not like you just randomly pick an antibiotics, but like right. the penicillins, the macrolides, the tetracyclines tend to be some of the safe varieties. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, and especially the tetracyclines, their molecular structure is very similar to a number of other beneficial molecules. They're called quinones. Uh, coenzyme Q10 is the most famous one, but there are other ones that we've discussed in your previous podcast. Imodin from Cascara Bark is another one. Vitamin K actually is itself a quinone. It's a naftoquinone, type of naftoquinone. Um, methylene blue is another one. And if you look at the chemical structure, the tetracycline antibiotics are basically very similar to the anthra, 
to the uh, to the anthraquinones like emodin, which is the quinone from cascara bark. So aside from there, and I think this is actually how they they kill most of the bacteria. They increase the production of reactive oxygen species, and this is such a basic mechanism that bacteria cannot really adapt to. I mean, it's it's not metal in blue is now used, which is another type of quinone-like molecule is now used to treat bacterial infections that are known to be resistant to any antibiotic simply by giving methylene blue, exposing people to bright light, and the combination of the these, these high-energy photons that permeate the tissues and react with the quinone, they cause the creation, they, uh, they increase the, the synthesis of hydrogen peroxide and superoxide, these, these reactive oxygen species, and bacteria dies. So apparently the same thing is happening for the cancer. Cancers are very sensitive. Cancer cells are very sensitive to reactive oxygen species. They're, they accumulate antioxidants. That's how they protect themselves. So when you give these antibiotics, you kill the cancer by creating, by restoring, in fact, oxidative metabolism. Okay, so uh, I pulled up your article, Elevated Serotonin Increases Criminal Activity. So the traditional stress system is the HPA axes the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals. And then endotoxin is kind of like a wild card into the the stress axes because that can be an independent activator of like directly on the adrenals, I think. Yes. And all, and all, and, and and turn up nitric oxide, which could uh, uh, turn up different parts of the stress system, you know, and. uh, So let me explain how this actually directly happens. So uh, (laughs) most people probably don't know, but. 90% 90% of the serotonin is produced uh, in your GI tract. Yeah, I was, I was going right in that direction. <laughs> okay. And and one of the great, one probably one of the primary signals for the synthesis of serotonin in the in the chromavin cells, which are lining up the gut, is the presence of endotoxin. So the activation of this TLR4, toll-like receptor 4 receptor by endotoxin, is the most potent signal for these cells to start producing serotonin. Serotonin directly activates the synthesis of both CRH and ACTH, both of them independently. You can actually block the, C- the, the CRH receptor with a, with a chemical that blocks it, but even without it, serotonin will still increase the synthesis of ACTH and as such will trigger the synthesis of cortisol. So eating foods that give you endotoxin will replicate the stress reaction without the brain being involved at all. It will be as if you met a uh, a grizzly bear, like in the in the in the woods, you, it, it will be the exact same mechanism, and this can happen chronically. And the the bacteria would be like a chronic irritation, therefore exactly. the, the intestine would chronically be putting out serotonin. Exactly. And just the functional role of sero- serotonin, uh, it could be reduced down to increasing peristalsis, like inducing diarrhea. Oh. Inducing diarrhea, and it's it's basically the two main functions of serotonin, at least in nature. Number one, it numbs pain. Mm. Number two, it, it cuts off all non-vital functions so that it conserves energy. So in other words, it puts you in a, in a mode of hibernation. And unsurprisingly, the all hibernating animals have been shown to, the, the, the onset of hibernation is actually triggered by these animals increasing their own endogenous synthesis of serotonin. That's what puts them into, into stupor, into this, this zombie-like state where they're alive, but they produce, their, their metabolic rate drops dramatically. So just as I said, all that remains is your vital functions and your lizard brain. So you're you're alive, but you're not exactly human. And so, th- I mean, this is one of the things that really interested me about serotonin is like thinking that a majority of people, their thyroid function is turned down. And one of the regulators, uh, the, you said the enterochromaffin cells are producing serotonin. And then the right. platelets are picking the serotonin up from the intestine and then and carrying it around, carrying it yep. around and being detoxified the lungs. And if there's low thyroid function, low CO2, all the tissues tend to become leaky and then the platelets leak their serotonin. And so if this is a generalized state that many people are in, because uh, like it, it's no surprise, it's not a surprise, um, or maybe you can weave it together, but the, that uh, criminal activity would increase because this it's cre- creates like a, a, a mob of kind of sociopathic behavior like you mentioned it's turning off your vital or like differentiated uh higher human abilities and reducing a person down to just uh that the bottom of maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs yeah. you know? so it, ter- it turns out the, the the frontal cortex and basically what what serotonin does is ultimately all aggression at least in every animal model has been studied has been shown to be a decline in brain atp 
and in other words, energy energy deficiency, right? And so when you're energetically deficient, all of these things like you know kindness, wisdom, love. I posted a study on that too. There was a successful lawsuit that, that where a criminal was defended successfully because their lawyer successfully argued that certain allergic drugs like the SSRI, they kill love, wisdom, understanding, empathy, etc. They basically turn you into a criminal. And the judge and the jury bought it. Apparently the evidence, it, it wasn't just some lawyer who stood, stood up there and gave a great argument. They called medical expert, they presented evidence. So apparently it can be successfully argued in a courtroom the really serious crimes can be completely excused because you are not you. You become deranged when your serotonin is elevated. One way to be elevated is with drugs. Another one is to be, is to elevate is to be, to be with chronic stress. And I, there's another study which I posted on the forum showing that serotonin, even a mild elevation in serotonin reduces brain ATP levels by at least 20%. And subsequent studies independent of that show that Anything more than 50% drop of ATP immediately triggers aggression. I guess you start behaving as if the entire world is your enemy simply because the world by its nature is a demanding entity. It demands a response from you. And if you don't have the energy to respond, you basically treat it as an irritator, as an irritant, as something that bugs you, that bothers you. And if you, as I, I forgot who was the research who said, if the world doesn't allow you to regress, then you start aggressing, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, if whoever happens to be around, whatever entity happens to be around will be the outlet of your anger, of your aggression. You know, hopefully it's not a human. Some people kick boxes. Some people go and, you know, you know, punch a punching bag. But ultimately it all comes down to this this behavior that we most of us dislike and clearly we, we don't think it's healthy is actually a very, very clearly provable energetic deficiency triggered mostly by serotonin. That paper by Paul Andrews, the is serotonin an upper or downer, is just f yeah. phenomenal, I think. And then, I'm sure you've seen it, but that there's a paper by Toppy et al., and it's called uh, Serotonin, a Drive to Withdraw, and it perfectly integrates to what you're talking about. Is It's like, uh, I think they described it as a person like seeing an adverse, high-stimulation environment, and then if their serotonin, the, ser the function of serotonin was to withdraw from that situation, like it was right. too risky. And right. so... So again, this uh, fits into a whole like kind of uh, <laughs> a populace of like zombies that don't want to take any chances or risks uh, yeah. because you're conserving energy, basically. They also did a study which showed, and they, they they took some biomarkers. They actually did a metabolomic study. They showed that whenever your your energy production declines, you become extremely risk averse. But and I think it's a very natural, like it's a very intuitive feeling. Like clearly, if you feel like you're not up to the situation, not up to the task you're probably going to shy away from it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been shown that the feeling of feeling up to a task is actually directly dependent on the level of ATP production. And they measure it with CO2 output. And they have like, they in some cases, they even took biopsies from, from people. They also do functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, which shows the, the consumption of, uh, the production of energy in the brain, the consumption of glucose, the glucose consumption rate, right? And it's been shown that as soon as you have 10 or more percent decline in that metabolic activity in the brain. Most people become extremely, you know, risk averse, shy. You want to call it shy, right? And if you continue to hit them up with even more demanding situations, then they become aggressive, right? They they don't want to be involved. They don't feel like they can they can muster a response. Uh, well, you mentioned kind of uh, along the lines of autism, you know. And so I brought up your article, allopregnanolone deficiency during pregnancy causes autism. Oh, great! Actually, the one that I haven't posted on the on the forum because we, I, I, you know, we had this podcast today, and I, I started coding it up, I started typing it up, but I hadn't posted this. They just showed conclusively that SSRI, given like basically give, giving pregnant women SSRI drugs, serotonin drugs, or increasing serotonin levels abnormally through other means directly causes autism in the offspring. Mm -hmm. And they also show that even after autism develops, giving the offspring with autism a serotonin antagonist completely reversed the symptomatology is what they caused. Um, so so basically, uh, in addition to, and by the way, allopregnanolone, not many people know, but allopregnanolone, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, even DHEA, but not so much, they're actually, these, these steroids are serotonin antagonists at the very least on the 5-HT3 receptor. 
Ray said the whole GABA system was basically like an anti-serotonin. Anti-serotonin. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So all GABA agonists have, have a – all GABA agonists, including GABA itself, um, are known to increase the degradation and the elimination of serotonin. So um, so anyway, so I'll post the study and link to the allopregnant one. But this study actually said um, – because currently most SSRI drugs are approved actually as being safe for pregnancy. And I think many women are being pushed, even if they're healthy – into actually trying an SSRI because the doctor is saying, well, you do know that uh, the risk of postpartum depression is really high, uh, you know, and if you have, especially if you have like a family history or you're, if um, it's not a coincidence that they ask you about your family situation when, when you go for the evaluation if you're a pregnant woman. They ask about everything, like job-wise, your husband, your family, and then this actually allows the doctor to come back and, I'm going to say it, to manipulate you into jumping on these drugs because they will say, well, we think that you are at a higher risk of postpartum depression, even though the baby hasn't been born yet, because, well, your husband is unemployed or your mom died or something else happened. So why don't we start you on an SSRI right now? We'll do a low dosage. And then this, we think that this will lower the risk of you developing postpartum depression when you, uh, when you actually deliver the baby. And even aside from them, even women that are depressed, they're being told, don't stop your antidepressant after you get pregnant. It's perfectly safe. Well, not. The study basically said it's criminally, I think it said actually criminally negligent to continue prescribing SSRI drugs to women in, in light of what they, this study just discovered. I know somebody that took SSRIs while they were pregnant. So it's, uh, I've, se I've seen the effects firsthand. But do you, do you want to uh, riff on allopregnanolone a little bit? Because, uh, it, it, it is regulating regulating GABA in some significant way, and it's one of the reasons the progesterone is so important, you know, because it's a derivative from, from progesterone. And right. So uh, maybe 5-AR activity, like why you do not want to inhibit that. Inhibit, time. yeah. So 5-AR, so, uh, so first of all, allopregnanolone is considered the main inhibitory neurosteroid in the brain, and it's a, it's a metabolite of progesterone, and basically progesterone gets converted – through the through the enzyme 5 alpha reductase it's get converted to something called 5 alpha dihydroprogesterone which is the saturated version fully saturated version of progesterone and then another uh, enzyme called 3 alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase converts 5 alpha dihydroprogesterone into allopregnanolone and allopregnanolone just happens to be the most potent known endogenous agonist of the GABA receptor it's even more potent than progesterone progesterone is another one right um, and basically, this inhibitory neurotransmitter, is, it's been shown to have potent neuroprotective, antidepressant, euphoric, um, like uh, immune-stimulating, uh, anti-infective, anti-dementia properties to the point where FDA approved it last month. I, I'm sure you've seen the post that I made on the forum. Uh, it, allopregnanolone is now officially approved as an antidepressant drug for treating postpartum depression. Okay, I did say that. Yeah. So, so basically, all of these inhibitory um, neurosteroids, actually, allopregnanolone specifically. So, you, in order for you to synthesize, first of all, you need to produce sufficient progesterone, right? So, you need cholesterol. Uh, another, you know, big myth that cholesterol is bad for you. Well, without it, you we, you don't get progesterone. You don't get pregnenolone. You don't get allopregnanolone. So, first you synthesize progesterone. Uh, first, pregnenolone from cholesterol. Then you synthesize progesterone, and then you need the enzyme five alpha reductase. And that enzyme has been demonized in, in medical uh, culture because it is thought to be the enzyme because that's, that's very bad for men, but they all suspect it's also bad for women because it's, through, it's the enzyme which synthesizes the potent androgen dihydrotestosterone from testosterone. And, and basically, they, this, there are many drugs on the market that were developed specifically to inhibit the activity of this enzyme. Finasteride is probably the most well-known one. There's another one called dutasteride. The number of different das uh, uh, tasterides that are, that are derivatives of, the, of this drug. So this enzyme 5-alpha reductase is actually crucial not only for synthesizing the, these potently inhibitory uh, beneficial neurosteroids, but also it's crucial for converting some of the stress hormones into beneficial ones. So uh, cortisol can actually be converted to 5-alpha uh, dihydrocortisol, and so basically 5-alpha reductase can take as an input some of the glucocorticoid hormones and convert them into their fully saturated varieties 
which actually have benefits. Let me turn on the lights. Okay. <laughs> uh, is, I don't have any moderators in the chat, so people say it's going to hell. What's um, going to hell? I haven't been reading, guys, so I don't know, I don't know <laughs> what's going on. Um, well, the chat is not working? No, it's working, but people are saying it's uh, going nutty. But eventually I'll okay. have some moderators, but uh, I don't know. We'll have to wait until then. Sorry, keep going, Georgie. Yeah, so so it's, I mean, it's known in biochemical circles that the enzyme 5 alpha reductase is actually crucial for two, for two things. Number one, it's to deactivate cortisol and, some, and uh, glucocorticoids. One of the pathways of, of deactivation of those other than glucuronidation is converting them into their fully saturated derivatives, which actually have calming effect. Again, they, they're GABA agonists, not as potent as allopregnanolone, but still um, they don't have the glucocorticoid effects of the unsaturated uh, uh, precursors like cortisol or cortisol. And another crucial function for 5-alpha five, five reductase enzyme is the synthesis of bile acids. Without bile acids, you cannot properly digest fat. Without the proper digestion of fat, the, uh, the, basically the uh, um, absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, all of which are crucial for health, and you can even die like if you, you know, develop a severe deficiency, you cannot absorb them. So inhibiting the enzyme 5-alpha reductase has tremendously detrimental effects um, on both your nervous system and, and your digestive system as well. Um, and, you know, um, I think finasteride will actually go down in history as probably one of the most evil drugs produced because, to be honest, I don't know of a single physiological function aside, well, care being non-physiological, and I, I mean systemic function, that finasteride affects in a good way. Um, there, there was even a proposal for FDA to issue a black box warning for finasteride because it's known now to, you know, cause this still unrecognized post-finasteride syndrome, but also because it elevates cortisol because if you block 5-alpha reductase, cortisol cannot be properly deactivated. Um, you, you start getting these malabsorption symptoms because bile acids cannot be produced, right? So overall, if we, if we, if we buy into the theory that functional disturbance ultimately leads to structural disturbance, if you can't properly absorb food, Clearly, your, your energy production will also be affected in a bad way. Good stuff. Uh, so I have some pa Patreon questions, so we should probably jump to those. And then sure. I, we did get some super chats, but I actually don't know how to like see them, <laughs> which is a little bit of a problem. Um, and so I'll, I think I'll, I'll figure it out. But, uh, okay, this one's from Tommy, and they say, uh, remember to save it to your channel as the EU plebs. Uh, okay. Uh, they say, I'm 24, 24 years old and probably have been hypothyroid since birth and have been suffering the consequences of of that for the la uh, last five years. My symptoms are very bad digestion, fullness, bloating, and very bad mental state, depressed, and constant feelings of stress. Do you think I can heal and recover from being hypometabolic uh, for all my li life with long-term T3 supplementation? My diet is very rapey inspired uh i'm using only t3 now he's using 50 micrograms per day so he's 24 years old uh right. lifelong lifelong history of being low thyroid he says what do you think i think everything is recoverable um i, I haven't seen evidence of of any condition to show that that is that is 100 percent set in stone nothing can really be recovered with the proper energy production, and recently even the pharmaceutical companies jumped on the bandwagon of reversibility by showing that, you know, even things like uh, heart failure, which is a, you know, a, essentially a, a, a fibrotic condition of the heart, or cirrhosis are reversible by administering drugs that block serotonin, a specific receptor of it. And, the you know, knowing the role of serotonin in energy production, if you can reverse these serious lethal conditions, I don't see why uh, a 24-year-old cannot improve their health dramatically or even completely restore it by proper thyroid supplementation, you know, proper diet. But above all, you I would suggest that person also evaluate the environment. Sometimes in order to get to that level, um, unless the mother was under severe stress while she was pregnant, usually there is some kind of a systemic stressor that is there, whether it's EMF or like an overly demanding job, um, or living close to, you know, um, like a plant that's really polluting the environment. There's usually something going on 
chronically in order for a, such a young person to be in a, in a such a poor metabolic state. So yes, to, my answer will be yes, it can be reversed. But I, will, in addition to taking the T3 and watching the diet, I would also evaluate my environment and see if there's anything there that's directly contributing severely to these problems and try to eliminate or change it or mitigate it somehow. Because in my experience, there is usually an environmental factor that is constantly present that is that is keeping these things from this making these things happen. Because otherwise, the body at such a young age is capable of recovering. So if you had a stress and you went away, you probably would not be in the state right now. Something is going on on an ongo- on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and I would, uh, I definitely rec- recommend lab tests. You know, I don't, I don't know if I just t- t- recommend somebody take like willy nilly. 50 micrograms of T3, you know, because I've seen far too many people with very low levels of cholesterol. And so that'd be like disastrous to take that, especially that much thyroid. And so again, we we're only seeing like a glimpse of the picture, but, um, I think that like, it's more expensive obviously, and you have to invest more, but getting like the, the prolactin and getting the TSH, yeah. getting the total cholesterol, Cortisol. the yeah. vitamin D like that, that can pay huge dividends and, and, from my point of view and yeah, it's more annoying. Yeah. It, it, it's a little bit of an investment, but it, I think it will save you like so much heartache, you know, because trying to figure some of this stuff out can be very difficult, you know? Yeah. And I'll, I'll make sure I split this dosage. 50 micrograms T3 should not be taken as a single dosage. Uh, I think that a healthy thyroid gland produces about a hundred micrograms per 24 hours. Um, and because it's, it, the T3 has such a short half life, it's only one or two hours. Basically, if that's their daily dosage, I would split it up um, in at least like five or six different pieces and and take that every few hours instead of uh, taking because if you take too too high of a dose of T3, the body will activate the the, the iodinase enzymes and it will convert it into the uh, weaker T1 and T2, which can then be reconverted back into T3. But basically, you feel like a, a jolt of energy. And then you may have a crash if you take that big dosage uh, in, a, in one sitting because most of it will be deactivated. The body will, has a good way of controlling, um, you know, um, over over di- um, over ingesting T3. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, Logan Taylor says, <laughs> what is your take on climate change? Do you think the focus on CO2 is, is a diversion uh, for the real issue? That's exactly what I was going to say. I think I think there is, of course, climate change. Um, but I don't think we're being told the full story. And in many cases, we're being diverted from asking the really important questions such as uh, why are so many people at such a young age developing these diseases that are that were known up until like 10 years ago, they were known to happen only in extremely old people. I posted a thread uh, which was named, titled, the, the Young Have Now Become the Old. And that, that thread basically lists a number of studies which show that 20-year-old people have these lethal diseases like pancreatic cancer uh, or Alzheimer or like uh, strokes or cardiovascular heart attacks it, it, the, uh, in their early 20s. And this was unheard of up until 10 years ago. So if, if and uh, even the official version is that unless, you, I mean, even if you believe in genetics, unless you believe that some kind of a mutation swept through the entire population and, and explains this, and even official medicine doesn't claim that anymore, then you have to... Uh, admit that something dramatically has deteriorated the environment over the last 10 to 20 years. That should be the real question. Now, climate change is probably one aspect of it, right? But the real question is, why are we, why is everybody dying or getting sick at such a young age? And if all health is an environment, is an environmental problem, environmental issue, then the question should be, well, what has deteriorated? Um, I, don't, I doubt that climate change is solely responsible for people dying and getting sick so young, right? So what else could be going on? Well, maybe it's something in the tap water. Maybe it's something in our food supply. Maybe the vast majority of these drugs and the over-medicalization of the entire system is really not good for us. Maybe the the way children are being raised in school, uh, you know, it really is not conducive to health. These are the real questions. This, these are all environmental questions as well. They're not necessarily climate questions, but those are the questions that I think the powers that be don't want people to ask because very quickly we'll realize that we are essentially paying a lot of money as workers to live in a dramatically deteriorated environment that up until 50 years ago wasn't considered fit for even hardened criminals. I mean, 
the in the up until the mid 50s the way we live now the our quality of life quality of food and everything else would be considered only fit for you know a maximum security prison <laughs> the rda values for most of the vitamins uh, i'm sure you've mentioned this on the podcast they were developed by studying uh, i think uh, in, uh, people in concentration camps and figuring out what is the minimum uh, amount of a specific substance that prevents them from dying that's clearly not something that's associated with health right but guess what? That's what's being used today. That's what we are being told is good for us. So, yes, I believe in climate change. I don't think it's the CO2, the increase in CO2 is the main issue. I think there are other things going on, such as, you know, radioactive isotopes being disposed of everywhere. Um, there's the pollution, the, the, the basically the, 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 the leakage of pharmaceuticals into groundwater and then make it, this making it's uh, make it, this way making their way back to, into the food supply. Uh, that is a much bigger question because uh, SSRIs and like uh, statin drugs and uh, and basically the uh, proton pump inhibitors, the anti acid drugs. These three classes of drugs are the most popularly prescribed ones. All of them have incredibly systemically negative effect on health. And now all of us are ingesting them or, or, or getting them from the rain because they're everywhere. They're in the groundwater. They're in, the, they're in rain, right? When, um, when rain starts falling, they're in the ocean or at least in the shallow waters around the beach. They show that crabs become homicidal and cannibalistic because they're being exposed to extremely low levels of SSRI drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine what happens to us. I mean, we actually give them high exposure because crabs live in the ocean, right? So by the time this, <laughs> these chemicals reach them, they're getting heavily diluted. Good stuff. Um... Eli Z says, how does Georgie stay abreast of all the latest health research? We went over this a little bit, but uh, you're just, you're, it's maintaining the curiosity is really the difficult thing. But the, yeah. if you have like a passion, you can kind of funnel that curiosity into the passion, but I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, I would say passion and time. Um, as they, the, one of my favorite books, Shawshank Redemption says that <laughs> all that it takes for anything in life is simply pressure, pressure and time. Well, I'll change it to passion and time, right? Um, so, I mean, there are many outlets there. Like, if you go to Reddit's science section, the, I mean, the, va the vast majority of it is junk, but still Reddit is a great resource for research, you know, being seen by the masses. And many of the studies that I post on the on my website or the Ray Pete forum, actually, they do come from Reddit. Um, it's just they're not very highly ranked. You just have to have the time to go through two, three, four, five hundred posts that are being made there, and then evaluate the links, the ones, the one that are interesting, and usually about one in ten turns out to be very interesting. Uh, obviously, I check PubMed on a daily basis. Uh, I have Google Alerts set up for over 400 different keywords. So the combination of that actually gives you even too much to mm -hmm. work with. So it's at this point, I'm actually thinking of you know, you know, cutting down at least the Google Alerts because my mailbox, um, I can't even see my regular email <laughs> because Google floods you with these things. And, and many of them are junk. Many of them are, you know, uh, marketing reports for like a new vitamin that came out or things like that, right? And they, like, of course, the com companies keep throwing keywords like Alzheimer's or Parkinson. And Google thinks, even mighty Google is not smart enough to know that this is just an ad. I'm not interested in that. I want the actual beat. I want the study. So anyway, so you can actually have too much information. Uh, that's how I keep abreast. Simply finding the time and making sure you don't burn out because some of this information that comes through, as many of you have realized, it's, it can be re rather depressing. I mean, we're under constant assault 24-7. Nobody out there is looking out for us. And not only that, but we are paying through our nose for all of this, essentially to get slowly poisoned, slowly killed. Um, and if you try to raise your voice, you will almost invariably be, be labeled either a lunatic or, or an alarmist. Uh, and and, and, and the, the, the worst part is that, you know, no matter what evidence you present, even if it's very legitimate evidence, most people actually, even on a very subconscious level, they just don't want to think about it. Because if you can't, if you think, if they think they can't change their environment, their lives, then why would I want to know that I'm basically screwed, right? It's, it's the ostrich algorithm, as they call it, the ostrich uh, attitude towards life. Bury your head in the sand and just hope that the trouble will like uh, pass you by, will go away. We kind of talked about this a little bit, but Kathy says, what are the benefits of methylene blue? Are the higher doses dangerous? Uh, she says this m may have been asked, answered elsewhere. <laughs> Well, it's a quinone. Basically, first of all, in, in, in times of hypoxia, when there's not enough oxygen around, 
uh, methyl in blue can actually fill in for oxygen and be and act as the terminal acceptor of electrons. Um, it has also been shown to be able to accept electrons at every stage of the electron flow from food to oxygen. If pyruvate dehydrogenase is downregulated, which, uh, which is it's, it happens to be in in almost any chronic condition, even acute ones, well. By raising the NAD to the NADH ratio, methylene blue does that by oxidizing, reoxidizing NADH back to NAD. That's what one one way to reactivate pyruvate hydrogenase. Afterwards, in the Krebs cycle or the electron transfer chain, if any of the steps that requires the acceptance of electrons is not working properly, methylene blue can step in. So it has this systemic, truly systemic effect on improving the electron flow, and that, in my opinion, is its most most important uh, uh, benefit. Second most important is it's capable of, first of all, inhibiting the enzyme inducible nitric oxide synthase, which is which is the enzyme that synthesizes, one of the enzymes that synthesizes uh, nitric oxide. And second of all, methylene blue is capable of actually directly deactivating nitric oxide um, by converting nitric oxide into nitrates. Um, and, and basically, in a third uh, Third benefit, which is related to nitric oxide, nitric oxide can actually bind with the enzyme cytochrome C oxidase, and the bond is strong. And the only two things that can break that bond is either red light or methylene blue. So and if cytochrome C oxidase is not working properly because it's blocked by, mitric, by nitric oxide, your oxidative metabolism is shut off. You cannot you cannot complete the last step. That's the that's that's electron transport chain. That's the last step of the electron transport chain, stage four, and methylene blue can unblock that. Right. So um, again, very few substances have such a systemic effect. Um, and in my opinion, methylene blue, the tetracyclines are another good example. I guess all quinones, all oxidizing agents, all electron withdrawing agents are expected to have this effect. But methylene blue is unique because there's already evidence that is capable of imp- improving the electron flow in virtually every blocked step of this of the three-step metabolic process: uh, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. Uh, there is one danger associated with methylene blue, and that is that in higher doses, it starts to inhibit the enzyme monoamine, monoamine oxidase type A. Um, and if if you take too much, especially if you're taking another drug that 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 promotes the synthesis of serotonin, so the Enzyme monoamine oxidase type A is the enzyme that's responsible for degrading serotonin, for deactivating serotonin. So if you inhibit that enzyme, you will build up serotonin. And it has been shown that when methylene blue, I don't think it has ever been shown that methylene blue can do it on its own, but methylene blue in combination with an SSRI drug or another drug that inhibits monoamine oxidase, uh, it can lead to serotonin syndrome. But again, the doses at which this has happened were hundreds of milligrams given in a single dose. And those are the doses of methylene blue used in hospitals because methylene blue is used to revive people from shock, especially um, during very prolonged surgeries like an open heart surgery or like a a major abdominal surgery, surgeries that last for more than, let's say, six hours. Methylene blue is used to essentially resuscitate the patient. But I don't think in the regular doses that uh, Ray Pete has mentioned um, or that have been used orally on humans, I, I, I don't think methylene blue is dangerous. And those doses just are usually capped at about 15 milligrams daily. And even at those oral doses, mer- methylene blue was shown to reverse bipolar disorder, psychosis, major depressive disorder. Um, so if that's the dosage that works, then you don't have a reason to take more. I would still avoid methylene blue if you are on some kind of a drug that is either a known monoamine A uh, inhibitor or... Um, you know, you're taking SSRIs. I mean, you shouldn't be taking SSRIs to start with, but if that's your drug, then I, would, I wouldn't add methylene blue to it. Uh, Yankel says, uh, for women having their ovulation sooner than expected, and guys, I will get to the super chats, don't worry, as soon as I figure out how to read them. <laughs> uh, Yankel says, for women having their ovulation sooner than expected, short follicular phase, uh, how, uh, how and can progesterone help regulate the cycle? Well, I think it's just a defi- it's a this is a a sign of progesterone deficiency, the shortening of that cycle. Um, so, um, physiological dose, I think for um, most women is depending on the phase, of course, right? But I think twenty to thirty milligrams should be enough to correct it. Um, raise of the opinion that pretty much any dosage can be used, but I found that for women, doses over a hundred milligrams daily 
can uh, can cause bleeding issues, especially when their period comes. It can cause heavy bleeding. Mm-hmm. Ironically, it can also protect from excessive bleeding if it's already in place. But if it's not already in place, um, some people have reported to me that taking more than a, some women taking more than 100 milligrams daily orally dissolved in vitamin A has caused them, uh, you know, uh, prolonged bleeding issues. Could be the vitamin A. Vitamin A is another drug that thins the blood. So um, it, it's not. I don't know if it has an effect of bleeding down there, but uh, it's it cannot be excluded. So I would start with 20 to 30 milligrams daily and see if that fixes the phases. If not, then you can increase. Um, but that's my warning. I mean, I've heard from several people, like I said, that over 100 milligrams uh, could be an issue with bleeding. Thank and you I will that. also test prolactin, by the way, because that will confirm whether there's an imbalance with uh, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, Baria says, uh, what are your experiences with B1? Is it safe to take orally? Uh, can you talk about how it can help with fatigue and autoimmune thyroiditis? So vitamin uh, B1, actually, um, for a while we were given the same like bad spiel that, oh, it's a waste of time to take it orally. It doesn't absorb. It has an active transport mechanism, which gets quickly saturated. Anything over five milligrams you'll just, you know, pull out. You're not going to absorb it. That turned out to be not true, as many other lies have been told. Um, a few human studies over the last year show that dosages as high as one and a half grams taken orally fully absorb. And if you maintain that dosing daily schedule for a week, at the end of the week, you actually achieve levels the same as the same dosage being given intravenously. So, like, let's say a, like a vitamin B1 dosage of a, or anything over 100 milligrams intravenous is considered a high one. That's usually given to people in hospitals. Uh, chronic alcoholics are notorious for showing up as vitamin B deficient, vitamin B1, um, and they can develop something called uh, Wiernicke Korshakov syndrome, which could be lethal. Um, uh, and it was thought that this syndrome is irreversible because it it basically damages the brain due to this deficiency in vitamin B1. That also turned out to be a lie, and now they're starting to treat the severe. A uh, neurological disorder with oral doses of vitamin B1 just to have to be taken a little bit longer. So I think that 100 milligram orally is should be fine to restore to re, uh, to restore whatever deficiency is out there. One exception is people with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, a few human studies found that those people, because they have a problem with the absorption mechanism due to the damaged gastrointestinal tract, they need higher doses orally, up to 600 milligrams daily. Um, and basically, unless you're one of these people, 100 milligrams should be enough, and vitamin B1 is crucial for the functioning of the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, It's now starting to be used by athletes, and in fact, there are uh, several Japanese companies producing synthetic versions of vitamin B1 that are thought to be more lipophilic. In other words, you know, get better, also absorb better, and also get into the cell more easily than regular vitamin B1, Mm -hmm. and some of these are alithiamine, Sulbu thiamine, fursul thiamine, a few other different thiamines that are that are synthetic. And uh, in Japan, they're actually regulated as drugs, and one of them is banned by the by WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Control Association Agency, because it's known to be a performance enhancing drug. Mm-hmm. How does it enhance performance? Which, uh, of course, per- performance enhancing to me means fatigue reducing, right? Which relates to the question. Um, it actually lowers the levels of lactic acid in the blood. And that's one of the primary inducers of muscular fatigue in any sport is as soon as lactic acid starts to build up, basically the performance of your muscles starts to decline. Mm -hmm. So that's what vitamin B, that's one of the core things. By reactivating pyruvate dehydrogenase, which usually is the rate-limiting step of metabolism, vitamin B1 lowers lactate, increases pyruvate, and, and allows pyruvate dehydrogenase to take pyruvate and convert it to acetyl-CoA and feed it into the Krebs cycle. It has numerous other um, uh, beneficial properties. Um, in the early 50s and up until the middle 60s, vitamin B1 was actually used for the treatment of psychiatric disease, usually in combination with a drug acetazolamide. Um, and since both vitamin B1 by lowering lactic acid, it, this means it raises carbon dioxide, and if it's not potent enough by adding acetazolamide, it was found, and I posted these studies on the forum, that it could actually reverse the symptoms of some very severe diseases 
and even allow people to be discharged of their asylums. Back in those days, mentally ill people were locked up in institutions, often for life. So even vitamin B1 by itself, and from what I remember, the dosage was about two grams orally. Mm. And when used in combination with the zolomide, was much less, it was like 500 milligrams, it was allowed to treat extremely severe mental illness. So that to me, uh, it demonstrates that it's, it is a vi vital factor in the production of energy. And because of these, this, these uh, synthetic versions being regulated as drugs, as performance enhancing drugs, I think it shows that it has a, um, a very central anti-fatigue mechanism. Sweet. Uh, <clears throat> this one's from Jay Feldman, uh, and they say, uh, there seems to be a trending anti-saturated fat bias on the forum due to research showing a small but significant postprandial increase in serum endotoxin in comparison to PUFA and MUFA, and in some instances, an increase in bacterial translocation. Do you think this is a relevant issue, especially in the context of specific liver protective effects on saturated uh, fatty acids, seeming endotoxin, endotoxin prote uh, protective effects on S uh, saturated fatty acids, intestinal epithelial junction protective effects? Uh, I mean, your, your, your general take on the idea that uh, saturated fatty acids are promoting endotoxin. Well, a couple of things. Human studies, which to me are the... The, uh, I guess the, the, at the top of the of the reliable evidence, uh, both in India and the United States, show that um, chronic alcoholics who have cir cirrhosis in a very advanced stage to the point of half of the liver is already gone. It's considered ir irreversibly damaged. So these people have an almost non-existent gut barrier. Almost anything they eat immediately generates endotoxin and most of it ends up in the blood. So studies in India in the 60s show that feeding these people butter or coconut oil not only reversed their cirrhosis, mm -hmm. but also stopped the endotoxemia. Oh, the Nanji guy. Yes, yeah. the Nanji studies. But those were also replicated in the United States, I think in the 70s. Ah. And it was done with medium chain triglycerides. So I think Nanji used butter because ghee is such a common product in India. Mm -hmm. But the, the ones that were, that were done in the United States, I think also in Germany, mm. used coconut oil or medium-chain triglycerides. Mm. They had the same findings. So um, I don't know why these studies are have that have they've been posted that are anti-saturated fat, um, what the really effect there is. But one, one user, one forum user noticed that almost all of them used something called a bovine serum albumin. Mm -hmm. It was co-administered with, with the saturated fats. And he found studies that showing that just the presence of this basically uh, animal albumin in the blood was enough to actually cause an inflammatory and allergic reaction and increase the synthesis and release of both tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha, and also um, nuclear factor kappa B, NFKB. And these two alone are enough to actually uh, cause uh, like a white, a systemic inflammatory reaction and 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 fibrotic effects. I don't think it's the saturated fat that's doing it directly. I think uh, it's it's some additional component in the diet. And oftentimes these high saturated fat diets that we're we we're being told they're really not. They actually end up being high saturated and high PUFA diets. Mm -hmm. It's just the way the studies are designed. There is no. I don't think there are many studies that used an entirely fully saturated diet. That's 100% coconut oil or like 100% fully hydrogenated uh, like a peanut oil. That's 100% saturated fat. Almost all of the ones that I've seen so far said, oh, anything over 20% uh, saturated fat in the diet is considered a high, high SFA diet. That's how we're going to label it. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it is. If you look at the child that are giving the, to these rodents or the animal models, uh, the rest of these, like let's say – 30% was coconut oil. Well, the other 70% was unsaturated fat, of which let's say 20% was MUFA, and then the remaining 50% was still PUFA. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to judge. It's, it, I wouldn't blame saturated fat given that no control experiment has, has been done so far with fully saturated fat, except with the human studies where when they did feed only saturated fat, and it was beneficial universally. So I would take that as stronger evidence. I think somebody just tried to call me on Skype. <laughs> okay, le we're learning as we go, guys. Um, right. This one's from Miles, and he has two questions. So he says, what can I do to mitigate my damage, uh, the damage stress caused by work night shifts? And then he says, please could Hayda talk about his own hair loss and recovery journey. So first, the work uh, 
working night shifts? He says, how could he mitig mitigate damage from that? Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, you can mitigate, but I don't think it can be fully reversed because circadian rhythm is extremely important for health, um, both for the hormonal uh, production and in general for basically um, um, uh, how the body deals with stress. So if you work, like uh, the darkness is one of the most fundamental stressors, and if you're working night shifts, I guess one of the most systemically protective things you can do is at least expose yourself to red light. Um, because if you're working in an office environment, that's it's probably not that difficult to implement. And if that cannot be done, then uh, the very, I mean, at least uh, many people work under fluorescent lights. And I posted a study on the forum showing that just a brief exposure to fluorescent lights triggered chronic inf inflammatory reaction, a, a chronic stress response, basically. Blue light, right? So the way to mitigate would be red light. If you can't do that, then I would make sure that you have – you know, enough supply of sweet stuff that's easily digestible, right? Um, and, you know, if if your your doctor is okay with it, um, things like thyroid, pregnenolone, the more the, the milder so-called pharma options would be uh, cyproheptadine or any, any other kind of anti-serotonergic drug. Serotonin rises tremendously during darkness. And even if you're not in darkness, if the body is still adjusted for you to be asleep, yet you continue working, serotonin will be high. And serotonin is what causes the so-called central fatigue, like the sleepiness, the fatigue, the moodiness. That's actually a sign that serotonin is rising and is known to happen to night owls, like around 2 a.m. Let's say like night owls are really perky at 10 at night, then they work really well till midnight and 1, and then around 2 o'clock they start getting really moody and irritable. Some of it could be, you know, dropping bl blood glucose and, elevating free fatty acids but a lot of it is serotonin so you can actually by blocking serotonin you can you can probably maintain some of the energy production and mitigate the effects of stress but long term i don't think this can be sustained in a healthy way so um i would su heavily suggest changing the, the or at least limiting the number of night shifts that this person works yeah that'd be that it seems very difficult to to like it, it, well, there was some study you might have posted it saying like just simply uh, sleep deprivation caused like a radical increase in like polysis or something, and so and right. it, it lasted for a while. So it seems pretty difficult. So the second part of the question in terms of my hair loss, I'll send pictures which you can post on your site. In two thousand and eight, in two thousand and nine, at the height of my paleo, I was completely bald. I had no hair, and then after that, I regrew about sixty percent of it. And now I'm at the point where during summers, so I will take another picture maybe in August, which is like at the very towards the end of the summer. Most of the most of my hair is back, and then I started I start again losing it in the fall, and it's actually the 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 lowest point is around January, which when the metabolism is really suffering from the you know prolonged winter nights and whatnot, and I start recovering again. So um, you know I haven't been able to maintain this complete recovery and, and keep it constant. But I think a lot of it for me is that, look, I continue to be exposed to stress. It's just the environment we live in. Um, I did make a recovery that most people would consider miraculous. I can maintain it entirely, but I'm glad that I still am capable of regrowing the hair at least half of the year. Um, and uh, for as long as I work 12 hours a day, which is what my life is right now, I, I think it would be too much for me to demand because, look, hair is almost like a in, in a – in an environment where you're, where you're chronically stressed, hair is one of the first things to go. Hair, sexual function, higher cognitive function, these are things that the body considers non-essential. It was the first thing to drop. Um, so to me, it's a great confirmation of Ray's ideas that I'm actually, for a few months of the year, I'm actually capable of having most of my hair back. There is a great, I think it's a Randall paper, uh, but they talked about, it's, I think it's called the marked seasonal effect on hair growth. And they say that, in summertime, the effect of uh, of summer on hair growth is so profound that it would have to be factored in to any drugs being tested because it would be uh, wow. just wouldn't be accurate to say like some drug worked if it was done in a summertime setting or something. Right. And then there's a really old um, paper by a guy named Pincus, and he was like an old hair loss researcher, and he has a quote something like everybody knows that summer hair is better than winter hair. <laughs> so it's just like this matter of fact kind of uh, ancient artifact. Uh, did, I'm 
Just a minute. Somebody said I'm muted. Am I muted? No. Okay. I think that's my buddy. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, man. I, uh, yeah, the seasonal thing. It, and again, it, that fits right into Ray's uh, idea of prolactin being influ- not Ray's idea. It's, it's validated by many different papers, but light having an influence on prolactin, suppressing it and darkness having an effect of increasing prolactin. Yeah, through serotonin usually. Serotonin is the master regulator of the brain, and and the brain is usually the master regulator of of most of the rest of the body. Um, In one of his books, Ray said that uh, metabolic medicine, which mostly, like uh, I think uh, some of the greatest researchers were in the Soviet Union, at least Russia before the communism, they said that the brain needs to be considered in every condition because it is involved. And it's, it so far has not been a single case where you find somebody who has a severe chronic problem elsewhere and then they also don't have either a mild dementia or a mood disorder or like a, or, you know, or a cognitive disorder of, of some sort. It's they're, they're always, they always go together because the brain consumes up to 40% of the, <laughs> of the calories consumed, right? It's 40% of the energy goes to the brain. So clearly such a energetically demanding organ, if there is any disturbance in metabolism, it will probably first hit there. And to me, that the fact that the hair is is gone, I think it's being such a close proximity to the brain. That's a great indication of that too. Sweet. Um, uh, Jay has another question, but I I I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all these questions. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind, Georgie. Like maybe shorter answers just for time. Okay. Um, just because we have quite a bit to get through. So he says. It seems that the main detrimental effects of antibiotics are a dissemination, decimation of the flora leading to downregulation of the immune system. The immune system tone seems to be depend, dependent upon interactions with the gut flora, thus the allowance of the opportunistic pathogenic species to adhere to the intestinal mucosa, mucosa such as C. diff spores. Do you guys think that ingesting medicinal mushrooms such as mataki or shiitake um, for their beta-glucans uh, during antibiotic use would be enough of a stimulant of the toll-like receptors to protect against the immune system down, down regulation and subsequent oppor- opportunistic infections. So do the beta-glucans protect against infections? I think that... So a couple of things. First of all, like if you if you have a completely clean gut, you're not going to lose your immune system. I think that's one other fad that medicine started saying that Oh, unless there is some, unless there is some endotoxin to stimulate your toll like toll like for uh, toll like receptors, T- the TLR receptors, your immune system will be gone. That's not true. So, so in other words, that's a bad way to stimulate the immune system. And by the way, this has been tried. Uh, the uh, inter- the the inflammatory mediator TNF alpha, tumor tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is heavily stimulated by endotoxin. So, a number of TLR4 agonists that work like endotoxin have actually been tried as treatment for a number of both infectious and even chronic diseases like cancer. So TNF therapy has been tried for cancer. Endotoxin therapy has been tried for cancer. TLR4 agonists have been tried for cancer. All of them failed universally. So I don't think this is a good way to stimulate the immune system. It is a, to the immune system, this is a sign that there is a pathogen present, right? So, so, um, but I do agree that if you take antibiotics chronically, then you stop, there is a risk of, of the, the gut being colonized by opportunistic bacteria, which can wreak other havoc aside from, from endotoxin, can actually infect the colon. And, and at this point, Crohn disease is actually considered now a bacterial disease in some countries caused by a mycobacterium species, I think. Mm-hmm. And now Crohn disease and even ulcerative colitis are being are being treated in some countries with antibiotics. So those bacteria, yes, there is, there is a small risk of if you take heavy dose of antibiotics and then you suddenly stop, there is a small chance that you may get either C. difficile, one of these other more pathogenic species that can actually cause damage to the to the colonic wall or the or the small the leal wall, or the small intestine. Um, it's a small risk, I think, and in that can be mostly prevented by the by by taking the basically eating insoluble fiber, which tends to curb the growth of this bacteria. Mushrooms, so in, in my opinion, mushrooms are much more beneficial for their fiber content and the, and their content of trehalose. Uh, which is a sugar that's known to inhibit the growth of the most pathogenic species of bacteria than they are for the beta-glucans. So um, if the beta-glucans can compete with endotoxin 
for the T for the TLR receptors, then I think there will be a benefit because if they compete and they're less activating uh, for the receptors than the endogenous endotoxin, then I think that there will be a, there will be a beneficial effect. Yeah, I don't know specifically about the beta glucans, but uh, I do have a paper on a gentleman that had like C diff where he was about to die, and the antibiotics were. I might be getting this slightly wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's accurate. But he uh, was given antibiotics and they weren't working, and then he was giving a like a drip of immunoglobulins, and that was the thing that cured him basically. And I know I at least have one paper about the plain white button mushroom increasing the antibody immuno, immunoglobulins and then thyroid and progesterone, those all also increase the immunoglobulins. So another thing that white button mushrooms and most mushrooms have actually is also a powerful aromatase inhibitors. And est estrogen is a very known um, major factor in suppressing immunity uh, to the point where I uh, posted a study on the forum which basically called for using aromatase inhibitors for completely restoring innate immunity in, 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 in the elderly, which are known to be susceptible to viral and bacterial infections. They usually, if you're old and you don't have some kind of a disease that kills you like cancer or Alzheimer's, you usually succumb to an infection of some sort. And they that study found out that um, you know they did it with animal model, but they also did some correlation with, with the hum known human studies is that if you block estrogen, the thymus regenerates almost completely, and that apparently is enough to prevent most of the age-associated decline of immunity and the opportunistic infections. I don't know if that happens in the colon too, but the, 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 the study made it sound like it's a systemic benefit. Sweet. Uh, this one's from, uh, we kind of went over this at the beginning, but um, Rain says, I won't be... Uh, it won't be anything new for people that follow uh, Ray Pete, but it would be useful for those uh, new new <laughs> to the bioenergetic view to give a brief summary possible of the three stages of oxidative metabolism, uh, how and when things can be shifted to the fatty acid metabolism, how they differ and the amount of ATP they produce and the different amounts of lactic acid CO2 created and why uh, one would prefer the former uh, the more youthful sugar burning metabolism and why choosing to go on a low carb carnivore diet shifts one cells to the direction of starvation disease state found in like uh, things like diabetes, cancer. and problems. So this could be literally two hours. So yeah. it's, uh, do you want again, maybe just uh, rephrasing the earlier elevator? Well, the three page? stages, the three stages are glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, right? So you can, you, you can burn at any point of time. The cell can, can oxidize either glucose or fat, and they compete through the so-called Rendell cycle, um, which is an is an accepted medical term, Rendell cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is that the, when the sugar enters the glycolysis, the output is pyruvate. Then pyruvate has to enter the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain are mitochondrial uh, functions. The glycolysis happens in the cytosol. So... If the, this enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which converts pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, it's not working properly, then you basically, you have, as an output of the glycolysis, you have pyruvate and NADH. And if NADH continues to build up and more pyruvate is produced, eventually the body needs the oxidized version of NADH, which is the NAD, in order to function. So in an emergency situation where oxygen is not available, basically the NADH gets reoxidized back to NAD in the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. So if those two are not working for whatever reason, if PDA, pyruvate dehydrogenase is not working properly, pyruvate cannot be consumed, then the body uses pyruvate as the emergency oxidant and oxidizes NADH back to NAD, but in the process creates lactate. And lactic acid has a hypoxic effect, has an angiogenesis effect, basically create the creation of new blood vessels. It has this fatiguing effect because it tells, this is a, one of the primary signals to the cell that the cell is under stress. Things, things are not going well. And if it continues for too long, it's been shown that the Warburg effect, so-called, which is the overproduction of lactic acid, even in the presence of oxygen, over time the cell can actually start to dismantle its entire mitochondria and then, then basically remain at almost nothing but only glycolysis. And that study, which I mentioned, it was posted on Reddit, said, we've been wrong for 100 years. The Warburg effect is not an effect only. It's also a cause. So a number of things can interfere in any of these steps. 
but the most one of the most vital ones is pyruvate dehydrogenase. Anything that lowers the NAD to the NADH ratio basically can can cause this enzyme to malfunction. So deficiency in vitamin B1, thiamine can cause it. Deficiency in magnesium can cause it because these are cofactors for this enzyme. Um, so basically what happens is that the the when the these uh, fatty acids, if they're unsaturated, they actually have an inflammatory effect. And anything with an inflammatory effect has a reductive effect on the whole metabolism and drops this NAD to the NADH ratio. So that's why... Uh, Oxidizing fat is, is not preferable for two reasons. Number one, most of us have to carry too much PUFA. So when you dump this PUFA into the bloodstream, the inflammatory reaction that it causes and also the estrogenic effect that it has, and estrogen also has uh, an effect on the NAD to the NADH ratio. Anything that drops this ratio, in other words, anything that shifts the ratio in favor of reduction has an antioxidative metabolic, antioxidative phosphorylation effect. Um, so... It will, it, will, it will be take too much time to go through every single enzyme that is part of the Krebs cycle and the electrotransport chain to explain, but nitric oxide blocks a, num a number of different enzymes within the mitochondria, Krebs cycle and electrotransport chain. Estrogen blocks a number of different ones, especially succinate dehydrogenase um, is heavily influenced by estrogen. Serotonin blocks pyruvate dehydrogenase, elevates glycolysis, it blocks cytochrome C oxidase, and because serotonin increases nitric oxide production, as I mentioned, nitric oxide production forms a very strong bond with cytochrome C oxidase. Prolactin, by elevating cortisol and serotonin and estrogen, also has this effect. And the reason it's not preferable to oxidize fat is because, as I mentioned, since the unsaturated fats share their structural relationship with all of these mediators, especially estrogen, uh, basically they act is similar to these hormones, and they cross-promote each other. So the reason it's not preferable to oxidize fat is, first of all, because most of that fat will probably be PUFA, given the diet we eat. And second of all, even if it was fully saturated, in general, oxidizing fat generates, I think it consumes more oxygen but produces less CO2 per unit. And it's the carbon dioxide that is not just a waste product, but it's one of the main inhibitors of both the lactic acid production and also carbon dioxide itself is known to stimulate the, the, the biogenesis of new mitochondria. And this is why athletes go and practice at, at elevation before, before uh, like uh, uh, big events because if you spend about two weeks at elevation, when you come down, you have both more uh, mitochondria per unit of space and, and basically, the mitochondria is more dense. So you're actually, you're producing more ATP and more CO2 per unit of oxygen than if you are living at, at a lower altitude. And it only, I mean, that can only be maintained for a few days because after that, the body adapts to the lower amount of, it basically it retains more CO2 at altitude, right? That's So the more CO2 makes you produce more mitochondria, so you generate more energy. So in general, that's it. I mean, basically... Burning fat is not preferable for two reasons. Number one, most of the PUFA will be inflammatory, anti-metabolic, anti-thyroid, pro-stress, right? And even if it's fully saturated, it is it's less metabolically efficient and it's less beneficial for the mitochondria than oxidizing sugar, which produces more CO2 per unit of oxygen consumed. That's the best I can summarize. You're amazing. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Miles, uh, Miles says, any tips for treating eczema and dry skin? Uh, in my experience, eczema is almost universally an, an estrogen excess. Um, so I would, first of all, I would, if possible, I would do some blood tests. Maybe prolactin would be a good one. Vitamin D. Also, um, almost every single patient of eczema, there was a study that came out recently showed that every person with um, like a chronic skin disorder of some sort was found to be severely vitamin D deficient. And then now they're proposing using like 5,000 units daily of vitamin D to actually cure most skin conditions or at least keep them in remission, as they call it, including psoriasis. And eczema and psoriasis have a very intimate relationship. Many people with eczema um, go on to develop, I shouldn't say many, but some of them go on to develop full-blown psoriasis. So eczema and psoriasis are both related to the, uh, to the energetic deficiency, of course, like any other disease, but... Estrogen is very intimately involved. So I know people who have improved dramatically with vitamin D, as I said, progesterone, pregnenolone, or antihistamines. And antihistamines have a direct anti-eczematic effect, but they also block 
antihistamines block the effects of estrogen at, at the tissue level. Um, so so things like, um, I don't know, I guess the safest one would be travel with Benadryl, right? It's over the counter. Another safe one is doxylamine. It's one of the older generation antihistamines. I think cyproheptamine would be ideal because of it also of its of its anti serotonin effect as well. And recent studies show that cyproheptamine is actually capable of directly blocking both estrogen receptor A and B with preference for A, which is considered the more nefarious one in medical circles. Um, but I would also test for thyroid. I mean, typically there is a good correlation between t- levels of TSH and autoimmune conditions. Um, and even though eczema is not officially considered an autoimmune one, there, is, there are studies that show a correlation between TSH and eczema. So in general, I think it's still a energetic dysfunction, but some of the more directly helpful things like vitamin D, pregnenolone, progesterone, and antihistamines will be the first things I'll try. Amazing. Uh, this one's from Bart uh, Lutmers. He says, high cortisol, muscle loss and weakness, dizziness, hypoglycemia, how to get out of the situation? A lot of pe- things that work pro-metabolic seem to be fueling the fire. Uh, so a couple of things. I would actually, I mean, uh, sometimes there may be, um, like there may be something in there that's that's fueling the, the extra cortisol synthesis. Many people have something called uh, adrenal incidental lomas. Mm-hmm. These are benign tumors that live in the adrenal gland, and they only produce cortisol like at certain times, they don't do it all the time. So some people have full-blown adrenal adenomas, like benign tumors again, but they produce cortisol consistently. Th- these are very common, but the incidental lomas apparently are, are so common that now they're saying that most people over the age of 40 have at least a micro incidental loma in at least one of the adrenal glands. Mm. So um, I would actually try to test cortisol, both the AM and the PM uh, version, as I mentioned before. Um, it's important because the ranges are different for each of the tests. So I, w- I would do a blood test for AM and PM in the same day. You can do draw blood from different arms so you don't get have to get stuck twice. Same arm, it's not pleasant. I've had it done. It's really not pleasant. They can actually rupture the vein and then it becomes dangerous. Um, so test cortisol and test prolactin. Test, of course, TSH. If the cortisol is more than 25% over the upper range of normal, I would consider maybe getting an ultrasound of the adrenals. It's it's a very cheap and, and benign uh, test, um, and the doctors will probably will refer you to do this anyways. Um, and then if, if God forbid, it turns out to be one of these incidentalomas, they're, again, they're benign tumors. They're not that dangerous. Sometimes things like a maybe higher dose progesterone, and for treating these incidentalomas, much higher dose of progesterone, unfortunately, are needed. I think the, the lowest effective dose is probably about 200 milligrams a day, uh, for a, for an adult, um, they're also uh, uh, like androgens. Most androgens in males have an anti cortisol effect. Testosterone was used up until the early 80s to treat almost any disorder involving excess cortisol, both in men and in women. But then that drug, the anti cortisol drug RU486, the abortion pill, took off. Was heavily marketed, and it's known as the abortion pill. But it was actually developed as a glucocorticoid blocker. It just so happens that the French company, I think Sanofi, that invented it, they invented it in the early 50s. And at the time, they said, well, there, is, there isn't much market for glucocorticoid antagonists, but guess what? The, uh, the contraceptive industry is picking up, so now we're going to market this as an abortion pill. But it really is, a, in its core, is actually a cortisol blocker. So doctor may be able to prescribe that. But I think testosterone for males, especially if it's a male, is it was one, of, one of the safer options. So that can be done to um, many cases, it will quickly actually regress the, if it, there is a tumor, it'll actually shrink it, and in many cases, it'll disappear. It's similar to the prolactinoma that's treatable with bromocryptine. And speaking of bromocryptine, anti-serotonin drugs like cyproheptadine have been used to successfully put in almost permanent remission even very severe Cushing syndrome, which is a very severe cortisol excess situation. So cyproheptadine in dosage as low as any any anti-serotonin drug, but especially cyproheptadine and uh, um, other general serotonins like miancerin, mirtazapin, um, they're available. They can use to they can be used to really suppress cortisol if it's confirmed to be high, and then you can use thyroid and general pro-metabolic therapies to get out of this vicious cycle. And once usually once metabolism is restored, the the organism can actually get rid of these. Uh, you know, cortisol producing masses, no matter where they are. Yeah. To Bart, I'd recommend getting 
the TSH, total cholesterol, vitamin D, and maybe some other blood tests, just so you're not screwing around um, and you have some information to go on. Uh, Dan <laughs> says, other than blood tests, how to gauge if you are overproducing lactate E.g. things to observe or try at home, such as reactions to different available substances. So how would you, are there certain symptoms you think of producing too much lactate? Yeah, um, excuse me. If you, if you are, if you are producing lactate, you will be chronically hyperventilating. So if you catch yourself that you're breathing mostly through your mouth, mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you, if it reaches a certain point, you're going to have actually trouble breathing. You actually, you, you, you'll start feeling like you're suffocating because that's, that's, due to the chronic lack of CO2. You cannot get proper tissue oxygenation unless you're producing CO2. That's how the body knows where to release the oxygen, by measuring, it in effect, you know, how much CO2 is being produced. So, um, of course, you'll start getting muscle soreness. Like, uh, uh, and it, it, these are really like more, actually more mild elevations of lactic acid. More severe ones that are called lactic acidosis, types, types A and B, uh, you'll start getting like, obvious tissues of hypoxia you'll start getting like the your extremities will uh, eventually start turning blue you'll have really hard time breathing um hopefully it doesn't get to that point but the most one of the most uh, um, uh, easy ones like i said mouth, chronic mouth breathing and trouble sleeping and actually sleep apnea sleep apnea is nothing but a chronic deficiency of co2 and it it's especially uh, visible or or uh, you know audible at night because that's when metabolism declines even more so if you have sleep apnea, if you breathe through your mouth constantly, if you cannot uh, walk briskly and maintain a conversation, that's another sign you're not producing enough CO2. Um, and one another good test would be if you take methylene blue, which is great, absolutely great at reducing lactic acid, and if even a one milligram dosage dramatically improves your general conditioning, that is a sign that you have more lactic acid than you need. You may not be at the range of lactic acidosis, but it's still too much for your, you know, for your benefit and not enough CO2. Brilliant. I like that walking test. That's a good idea. Um, so Dan has another question. He says, is prolactin the best measurement of estrogen in one's body or could one have relatively normal prolactin levels, but higher estrogen that is only caught in a different test? Uh, prolactin would be actually a good metric for tissue estrogen. Um, you, you also, there's another estrogen which serves as a reservoir, is like a long-term reservoir for estrogen, and that's how you know that the official story about menopause and estrogen is bunk. So there is this estrogen called estrone sulfate. So it's the sulfated version of estrone, also known as E1, and that is the long-term storage of estrogen in the body of both males and females. So estrone sulfate, it's not a test that's very common, but most labs do it. Doctors can recommend it, can actually, you know, uh, get it tested. So estrone sulfate is a very good um, determinant of your total body reserves of estrogen because estrone sulfate can easily get converted back to estrone. From there, it, it very easily can, can get converted to get reduced to estradiol and even estriol. So if prolactin is normal, um, then the next thing that I would test would be estrone sulfate. And if that's normal as well, I would also test cortisol. Cortisol and estrogen have a very intimate relationship. It's really hard to have one be abnormal and the other one normal. So if you have a cortisol problem, you usually also have an estrogen problem. And one of the most visible indicators of that is that almost everybody with an estrogen excess, uh, with a cortisol excess, has some form of gyno. Especially, I mean, I mean, I mean the males here. And as you see, most aging males, males over fifty, and now it's just, it's really not aging males. It's like many males, but most people, most males who are overweight and or old have some form of gyno. Even if they're, if you look at the studies, they say, oh, but they have normal serum levels of estrogens. Yeah, but gyno is a universally recognized symptom of high estrogen. So you know your estrogen is high. It's just you haven't found the proper biomarker for it. So the second one I'll test is estrogen sulfate. If that doesn't work, I'll test cortisol. If cortisol is high, then your estrogen, your systemic estrogenic tone cannot be low. Yeah, I'll just add uh, two cents to this. I, I've seen many tests come back of somebody experiencing like uh, what they describe to be intense hypothyroid uh, symptoms, hair loss, et cetera, low libido, whatever. And their prolactin will come back at like four or five, which is not by any means really that high. I would consider like 10 around like the the danger zone. Right. And uh, But I've all, they've also gotten their parathyroid hormone test 
tested and it was mid range, if not over that. Right. And then also they would also tend to get their cholesterol and TSH tested too. And so their TSH would predictably be around two or over, you know, and then, uh, vitamin D might be low. And then, um, what was the total cholesterol might be abnormally low or it might be way too high, you know? So I think you got to put everything into perspective and, uh, and again, I'm just, tr- uh, the prolactin I think can be, and you posted papers on this, but it can be influenced by so many different things. And so just because you got a test that showed that it was low, doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't spike two hours later when you, you just gave me a great idea. So uh, two papers that I'll post, it showed that some of the neurotransmitters, even though they're structured, they're not even close to the hormones, are actually directly capable of activating like steroid receptors, for example. And that actually explains why some of the drugs that have this, these effects are beneficial. For example, dopamine and dopamine agonists are known, have been shown conclusively to activate the, the, both the progesterone receptors A and B. Mm-hmm. So they can act like progesterone even though they're, they're not structurally related. Mm-hmm. Conversely, serotonin is actually known to activate estrogen receptors A and B. So antagonists of these hormones can do the opposite thing. So anyways, the bottom line is that many of these stress mediators, not only they they, they uh, promote each other, but they're actually capable of acting on the same receptor sites. And sometimes when you have a sub- substance acting on the receptors, the actual endogenous substance that you're looking for will actually get down-regulated in a negative feedback mechanism. So sometimes if your estrogen is very low in the serum, it may mean that there is something else there acting like estrogen, yeah. and that's why your your estrogen or prolactin or whatnot are being low. Mm-hmm. The, the, but you still are I- I- in, a, I- in a state of excess of that specific substance. Yeah. A great example would be bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is actually a estrogen receptor agonist, and it's known that when you when you expose people, animals, any organism to it, estrogen levels in the body drop because it is considered a synthetic estrogen. The body says, "Oh, I have too much, right? Let me let me downregulate my own one." So you can have like below the level, of the normal range. And the doctor will be thrilled for a postmenopausal woman saying, "Oh, you have low risk of breast cancer." No, still very much estrogenic tone. Mm-hmm. So the same thing, I, I, th- I mean, there's evidence that this thing happens for many of the, both the stress mediators and the anti-stress mediators as well. Sweet. Um, okay, two more. Zach Bogley says, hi, Danny. In your video on the misunderstood role of DHT in pattern baldness, you mentioned that hyperadrenalism leads to an increase in 5-alpha reductase activity. Can you and Georgie elaborate on what the implications are for having an excess of 5-AR in the scalp? Thank you. So I haven't watched that video since I posted it. So I honestly don't even remember what I said. But the I, I actually think I got this idea from you because you had posted some paper on saying how when the – or maybe synthesized it in a way that the thyroid gets suppressed. Yes. The, Adrenals pick up the slack. The, the and adrenal- basically – so basically thyroid hypoactivity almost almost uh, immediately results in adrenal hyperactivity. And that the study that I posted was actually related to ALS, that lethal disease, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which said that in every single patient that they examined the records for, there was, you know, severe, uh, there was irrefutable evidence that thyroid function was suppressed and there was adrenal overactivity. So when you have adrenal overactivity, you basically get, um, first of all, this is interpreted by the body as whenever your adrenal is, is, is overactive and thyroid is suppressed, gonadal synthesis will also decline. So what you basically have is the adrenals pick up the slack and they produce these precursors such as the hydroepiandrosterone, DHEA, right? And the, these precursors circulate and because in the absence of your gonadal uh, organs in your gonadal tissue that is the main synthesis, the main the main source of androgen synthesis for males, then the skin becomes the second most active steroidogenic tissue. It's actually the second most active one after after your gonads. So the skin starts taking this DHEA and and uh, metabolizing into into stronger androgens, um, including dihydrotestosterone. But more importantly, not just that, but one of its uh, metabolites known as uh, 5-alpha androstyne diol. So it's a degradation product of DHT that has been shown to be associated with with, full, with whole body hair mm. and with hair loss. Mm. So usually people losing their hair are actually 
abnormally hairy body wise mm-hmm. and i happen to be that way <laughs> i don't know if it's abnormally but actually when i um i remember now when i uh, since i said I, I was completely bald in 2009 i had an excessive amount of body hair to the point of starting to grow on my neck and on my back and even the doctor like remarked and said this is hirsutism and we know to be associated with adrenal hyperactivity yeah it happens in women too uh, especially in women with polycystic ovary syndrome, which is now known to be driven by estrogen and irritating the adrenals, causing an adrenal hyperactivity and causing thyroid hypoactivity. And then this elevated DHEA gets metabolized in the skin and, and causing them to be hirsute. So anyway, so but a study that I posted showed that actually men, with, with especially with male pattern baldness, they have low serum levels, lower serum levels of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Mm-hmm. They have usually higher levels of DHEA and especially high levels in the scalp of the DHT metabolite 3 alpha, I'm sorry, 5 alpha androstain diol. So both people have both decreased gonadal synthesis of androgens and increased degradation of androgens in the scalp to products, to byproducts that. Um, are, are probably the direct cause of balding. Basically, the uh, 5-alpha androstain diol has been shown to have an, a proestrogenic and an anti-metabolic effect, at least in the hair follicles. But DHT itself does not. Yeah, good stuff. Um, yeah, and again, the, the traditional way of viewing this is to just hyper-focus on 5-AR and just like obsess right. over it and not and not think about anything else you had just mentioned, you know? Let um, me just give one example of 5-AR. Recent study found out that, that schizophrenia can be treated by intravenously injecting the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, mm-hmm. which shows that it's absolutely crucial for brain health. I think it, co- it goes down to 5-alpha reductase being capable of deactivating excessive cortisol, which is known to be implicated in schizophrenia as well. So that that's how bad this enzyme is for you. Yeah. Without it, you can develop schiz- schizophrenia. Okay, last question. I can't believe we... Oh, and then the Super Chats. But Dan said, in generative energy number 10, mood and digestion, you discuss the negative adaptations the body undergoes from excessive endurance exercise, i.e. the overproduction of lactic acid, body adapting to fat, resulting in uh, hypoxia. How best to break out of the this form? B3, methylene blue, what about oxygen? So uh, another study which I posted years later showed that chronic endurance exercise caused an increased expression and activity of the cortisol synthesizing enzyme 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 and also a suppression of both the levels and the activity of the cortisol degrading enzyme 11-beta-HSD2. So 11-beta-HSD1 is the enzyme that converts the relatively inactive cortisone into cortisol. And 11-beta-HSD2 is the one that does the reverse. It deactivates cortisol. So um, basically, the both of these enzymes are driven, again, by the ratio of NAD to NADH. So if a chronic endurance exercise or, in general, chronic stress makes you prone to overproducing cortisol and under-deactivating it, right, one way to improve that is by raising that ratio, NAD to the NADH. Methylene blue will be a great way. Um, Imodin, which is the uh, um, like the quinone in cascara, mm-hmm. is a one of the most potent known inhibitors of H of uh, 11 beta HSD type one. Um, anything that in, that that uh, blocks the cortisol activity in general by improving thyroid function should decrease the expression activity of these enzymes. Giving T3 is known to decrease the production of cortisol and the expression of the 11 beta HSD type one. But in general, if you are adapted to the stress and you continue to be under stress, everything would be a best patchwork until the stressful situation is somehow mitigated. Um, systemic stress is very, very pernicious. Uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard to to control. It, it, if it's there, then you're at most doing patchwork. So I am looking for the super chat right now. I'm like going through okay. the YouTube settings. They have to be somewhere. Uh, so I don't know if you want to. I'm just like, uh, I don't know if you want to chat about something or talk about idea labs. <laughs> I mean, it's up to you. Like, uh, so are you saying we can't find them? No, or like I, w- maybe I there will aren't find any? them. I just need a second to navigate in the menu. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, idea labs grew out of, uh, it's just entirely like a curiosity project. Uh, 
I mean, most of it you can see right behind me. It's basically just a bunch of cabinets with things we make. And we bottle them in a in a lab facility, which we ran out of university here. But it just started out as, as, a, as an experiment on myself. Um, and um, I decided, why not? Why not try some of these substances that Ray talks about? Why not turn them into products? Um, and started in 2014. And little by little, everything that I knew that I find and that I, I know for a fact that big, no, big Pharma will not pursue, doctors will not prescribe, but there is s serious evidence of a benefit, of metabolic benefit. Um, you know, if I, if I consider it worth it, you know, I will try to release as a product. Fat-soluble vitamins are a great example. Ray has an entire article on vitamin E, on vitamin A, on vitamin D, on vitamin K. All of these are very pro-metabolic chemicals. Vitamin E is probably our main defense against the uh, PUFA. Uh, vitamin uh, vitamin E. Vitamin K is the main factor for, for bone building because it attaches carbon dioxide to this protein called osteocalcin. And without this, and th that the enzyme gamma carboxylase is dependent on vitamin K. If you don't have vitamin K, most of the calcium will actually end up in your soft tissues. Um, and vitamin K has been known to even decalcify soft tissue. So all of these things that I, uh, that, I that is solely biochemical evidence for, but for whatever reason, the, the market here, or in general, the, the any market that where the medical industry controls it, it's not going to get released uh, to the public. I try to, you know, I try to make available as much as I can. That's 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 what Idea Labs is for. Ideas that I think are interesting and beneficial that will not otherwise get materialized. I try to materialize them. Sweet, thank you. I you gave me time to find the super chats. Okay, so if anybody has a burning question they want to ask Georgia and I. Uh, this is your time, but uh, Fuzzy Logic says, um, is a slightly sweet smelling urine concerning? Slightly sweet smelling urine. I mean, I would do, there's a very easy, uh, you can buy these glucose testing strips, urine testing strips, I think from CVS, mm -hmm. or if not CVS, even from Amazon, you can easily check. Usually, uh, like uh, if there's glucose in the urine, it doesn't smell sweet. Smell is uh, like sweetly smelling urine, maybe suggestive of a uh, of an excess of the amino acid phenylalanine, also known as maple syrup disease. That's what uh, that can actually cause a like a sweetish smell. But the glucose would be an easy test. And if you have a problem, if you, if it's really a concern, especially if you're starting to get symptoms of like uh, hyper hyperactivity, um, like insomnia, things like that, which would be signs of excessive phenylalanine, not being able to break down that amino acid. You can ask the doctor to do a quick test. Uh, it's it's a quick blood test, uh, but there will be th those will be the things I'll try. I think actually they, they even sell the strips for for maple syrup disease as well on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Just type, just just Google for like uh, urine glucose testing strips or like urine uh, urine maple syrup testing strips, and and then products will come up. That is for two dollars. Thank you so much, Fuzzy Logic. Uh, this one's from Mail Lane for two pounds, I think. And they say, thoughts on the work of Rostin C. Ph.D.? I have never heard of him. I have never heard of him either. I mean, can we get some more clarity on that? <laughs> well, let me <laughs> let me just – I'll Google him real fast. Um, Rostin C. Ph.D. Um, he's on Reddit. He is I, on Reddit or he's not? I guess we'll have to, we'd have to dedicate more time to this. Sorry, Mail Lane. If you can send us something, we can uh, read about him. Uh, one, uh, 199 from Cardo Chav. Thank you so much. Uh, they say happy to see you on YouTube. Thank you. We're, ha we're ecstatic. Uh, Eli for $2. Thank you so much, Eli. He says, we hear you better now. I think he was referring to earlier with the tech trouble. Um, yeah, I mean, that that is it. <laughs> Unless there's any <laughs> Not bad. chats, but you guys, this has been wild because I, I can't, like I said earlier, like this has been baking in my brain and trying to coerce Georgie, not that he was ever against it, like for a long time. And so I'm ecstatic to uh, be on, be here and we're going to be doing shows it, it, uh, according to Georgie's schedule because I'm more kind of free than he is. He has a family and a wife and things, so his life is much more important. Two kids. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we uh, will be doing them, trying to do them every other week, and we'll fall into some kind of rhythm. Uh, but, yeah, you guys are amazing for being here, being in the chat. Thank you guys so much. Sincerely appreciate it. You know, 
And thank you for watching this after the fact. Georgie, any parting words? Thank you, everybody. Without the this great audience, th these things wouldn't be happening. Thanks to Danny for organizing this. Um, you know, I really enjoy this because, you know, being being able to to speak to an audience that at the very least listen and ask questions is invaluable. I know quite a few medical doctors. Um, like half of them will just outright dismiss me. The other half will either get depressed by listening to me or say, "You better you better keep your mouth shut because we're either gonna get fired or you know like we we have families to feed." So it's very hard to talk about these topics with other people because for most of them these topics are either too remote or too dangerous or too depressing to consider. But as they say, without facing reality, you cannot really move forward. So for me, that's a way of, of, of making progress, of moving forward, having a receptive audience. And I don't mean audience audience that would agree with me. I don't like yes men. I like, as William Blake said, I like opposition. But opposition means you take what I say and then you come back with an actual genuine response, not just with a way that you can shut me down by using either your authority as a doctor or is simply because you say that's too much for me to consider. You know, I like my quiet life. <laughs> I like to be, you know, insignificant and depressed and leave me alone and that's it. So that audience that we have here is 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 completely different. It, it allows these things to happen. Let me just do one last check. Uh, okay, that's it. You guys are amazing. Georgie, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Sincerely appreciate it. And when was the next time we were going to do this? Steve, May, May 13, you said, or something? The 13th. Uh, May 20, no, not the 24th. The 7th, they're going to be gone this, the 31st. Okay, 31st. And okay. then I'm going to do something with Kyle on the 24th. Okay, so expect this, a little mix mix up for a schedule, but we're, we're trying to do these as regularly as, as we can. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the sweet music.